Good afternoon, everyone. At this time, would all sergeant at arms please start their recordings? Computer recording is up. Thank you. Cloud is going. Thank you. <clears throat> Back up. Back up is rolling. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council FY22 preliminary budget hearing for the Committee on Land Use and to join later the Committee on Technology. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification purposes. Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place all electronic devices to vibrant or silent mode. If you'd like to submit testimony, please send via email to testimony at council dot nyc dot gov again that is testimony at council dot nyc dot gov thank you for cooperation chairs we are ready to begin thank you uh sergeant of arms uh good afternoon i am council member rafael salamanca chair of the committee on land use uh i am joined remotely today by council members uh we have chair moya chair riley Council members Adam Ayala, Barron, Diaz Sr., Gradenchik, Ku, Perkins, and Rivera. Before we begin, I would like to recognize the committee council to review the remote meeting procedures. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. I am Julie Lubin, counsel to, counsel to this committee. During today's hearing, council members who would like to ask questions or make remarks should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of the participant panel. I will announce council members who have questions or remarks in the order that they raise their hands. Chair Salamanca will then recognize members to speak. Once your name has been called, you will receive an unmute request. There may be a brief delay in this process. We ask that you please be patient if any technical difficulties arise today. Chair Salamanca will now continue with today's agenda. Uh, thank you, council. Uh, today we will examine the fiscal 2022 preliminary plan and preliminary fiscal 2021 mayor's management report for the Department of City Planning, DCP. This hearing will review the Department of City Planning's proposed $42 million fiscal 2022 preliminary budget. While this figure appears small in the context of the city's overall budget, ensuring that the Department of City Planning is adequately equipped to perform its functions is crucial. City planning is about defining our collective future as a city. Our questions will not only address the particulars of this year's budget, but the overall approach to city planning in New York and whether we are resourced to do the work we need to do to further the needs of our residents. Broadly, significant and serious questions have been raised by this council about the current practice of selecting only a handful of neighborhoods and engaging in contentious year-long individual planning process as our primary mode of accommodating growth. Without comprehensively addressing the needs of the entire city, New York has allowed decades old regulations to remain in place in many neighborhoods, a status quo the council would like to remedy. I would like to thank the director of the city planning um, and chair um, uh, Marissa Lago and Anita Lermont, Susan Amron and David Parrish for joining us today. I look forward to a robust, a robust conversation about ways in which we can improve on how we plan for our city. Chair Moya would also like to make an opening statement. So Chair Moya. Chair Moya. All right, I, I guess we lost him. So we will We'll proceed and then when he comes back, I would allow him to give an opening statement. Um, so therefore, uh, committee council, will you swear in uh, the, um, the, uh, the panelists? Yes, um, before responding, please um, state your name for the record. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth and to answer all council member questions truthfully? Panelist. Thank you. We were just unmuted. This is Marisa Lago, and I do. This is Anita Laramont, and I do. 
This is Susan Amron, and I do. This is David Parrish, and I do. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Chair Lago, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Chair Salamanca. And good afternoon as well to subcommittee chairs Moya and Riley, and also all the distinguished members of the Land Use Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss our department's preliminary FY22 budget. I'll start by sharing the urgent and ambitious recovery focused work that we plan to move through ULERP before the end of this city council's term. Our project pipeline is tailored to be responsive to council member priorities and our tremendous post-pandemic challenges. These projects will help us dismantle some of the stark racial inequities that continue to plague our city and that have been laying bare by the pandemic. They include the creation of permanently affordable homes in some of Brooklyn's and Manhattan's most centrally located high opportunity neighborhoods. Our work is simultaneously focused on access to jobs and job creation and to advancing key resiliency goals of this council and this administration. Each of the projects that we seek to advance builds on years of smart data analysis and planning and benefits from community input. Some of the largest private projects that you'll be asked to review and adopt promise significant upgrades to important healthcare facilities, including a proposed expansion of the New York Blood Center. Proposals that will come before this council include a handful of citywide zoning text amendments that are aimed at helping residents and small businesses recover from the effects of climate change and of the pandemic. First is Zoning for Coastal Resiliency, ZIGFR, a soup to nuts overhaul of zoning. ZIGFR is crafted to work in and for cities' diverse floodplain communities to protect them from devastating but infrequent storms like Sandy, as well as rising sea levels and daily flooding. We can never lose sight of the fact that our expanding floodplain is already home to 800,000 New Yorkers and tens of thousands of affordable homes, businesses, and jobs. We're also working on four new citywide text amendments, each aimed at smoothing the way for a fairer and more equitable recovery for communities and small businesses. This package of text amendments is being advanced in close partnership with the council and other city agencies. The FRESH proposal seeks to update and expand the 2009 FRESH program uses zoning to encourage the creation of accessible fresh grocery stores in communities with food needs. Our health and fitness proposal seeks to change outdated, outdated regulations that prohibit the location of new exercise gyms, licensed massage therapy, martial arts studios, and spas in many neighborhood retail locations. These anachronistic restrictions stymie the creation of small businesses that contribute to our well-being. Elevate Transit Zoning for Accessibility seeks to expand zoning rules that allow the MTA to leverage private development to build accessible public subway and commuter rail stations. Last but not least, we seek to make the city's open restaurants program permanent with more than 11,000 Next, I'll touch on some of the more significant public land use projects that are in or will enter ULERP in the coming months. Each is being advanced to aid in our recovery and to help dismantle inequities faced by our communities of color. You've likely heard about our ongoing work to advance the Gowanus and the Sohonoho neighborhood plans. Each aims to bring thousands of affordable housing, um, of affordable homes to a high opportunity neighborhood while also fixing outdated zoning requirements. Sorry, did we lose Chair Lago? Chair Lago? Is that better? Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. Currently in public review, the governor's island proposal seeks to ensure that this historic island is forever open to the public, while also serving as a home base for an important new climate center. You'll also be seeing private sector housing proposals. Um, 
two important MIH projects are the East New York Christian Cultural Center in Brooklyn and River North on Staten Island. Together, these projects would bring more than 700 permanently affordable homes, enough for some 1,500 New Yorkers. Since MIH's inception in 2016, over 3,300 new permanently affordable homes have been financed in 21 community districts, and MIH has been approved for future construction in 39 of our 59 community districts. Next, I'll describe two large public engagement and transparency projects um, that we recently launched, starting with NYC Engage. NYC Engage is a remote portal that allows anyone, anywhere to join City Planning Commission and DCP meetings, either online and importantly, also by telephone. This utilitarian portal allowed us to restart Euler in September. Since then, 49 proposals have entered public review. About half of them are housing projects that will bring nearly 5,800 new homes, with over 2,800 of them affordable units and more than 900 permanently affordable homes under MIH. Since NYC Engage debuted, the Commission and the Department have held 62 remote public meetings with more than 3,200 people joining. Some of our most important land use work is our ongoing neighborhood planning. And since October, we've hosted three public Soho NoHo community sessions, attracting close to 900 participants. Similarly, we and Brooklyn's Community Board 6 co-hosted three update meetings on the Gowanus neighborhood plan, drawing over 800 participants. The second transparency project is the department's updated zoning application portal, which we call ZAP. It's a multi-year project with a budget of $7.5 million. ZAP allows New Yorkers to view and download digital land use applications and related environmental review filings as they enter public review. It brings efficiency and transparency to our land use review and gives the public another tool to engage more fully in our public review process. I'll end with our financial overview. We entered FY21 with an adopted budget of 44.6 million and an authorized headcount of 361 full-time staff positions. Of these 54% or 160 positions are funded with city tax levy dollars. Our remaining budget allocation and positions are funded through state and federal grants, primarily through CDBG. Two thirds of our FY21 budget supports personnel services. In comparison to the FY21 adopted budget, our FY22 preliminary budget of 42.2 million and 334 full-time staff lines represents a net $2.4 million reduction and 27 position de decrease. This decrease is largely driven by the expiration of temporary funding allocations from prior fiscal years, including the expiration of our Hurricane Sandy CDBG disaster recovery grant, as well as several budget adjustments associated with agency savings initiatives, which we implemented to meet citywide budget reductions. We're working closely with OMB to preserve our important resiliency planning function. David Parrish and I would be pleased to answer any more detailed questions about our budget request, but suffice it to say that despite a 5% decline in funding, we will continue to use our resources as efficiently and effectively as possible to carry out our work program and to meet the needs of communities. And with that, I'm glad to take your questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair Lago. Um, I'm now just before I, I give you, you know, I do my rounds of questions. I'm going to allow Chair Moya to give his opening statement. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. Uh, thank you uh, to Chairwoman uh, Lago and to all my colleagues. I apologize for the uh, uh, technical hiccup there, um, but uh, thank you again to my colleagues, the committee and subcommittee in attendance today. And thank you to the representatives of the Department of City Planning uh, for testifying. 
the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises reviews and uh, makes recommendations on modifications to New York City zoning regulations, changes in zoning districts, applications for sidewalk cafes, and resolutions authorizing the city to make franchise agreements. It is important to uh, it is important work that touches the lives of all New Yorkers. Today, the council will exercise its mandate as the institution responsible for fiscal oversight of public funds, as prescribed by the city charter. Uh, it is the task of the Committee on Land Use and Z uh, Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises to assess the work conducted by the Department of City Planning, as well as to ensure the department is adequately equipped to undertake the work required in the years uh, to come. The Department of City Planning, unlike many other City agencies finds itself uniquely positioned to combat a vast array of challenges confronted by New Yorkers. Combating housing and food insecurity, providing reasonable access to public transportation, or even protecting residents from the symptoms of climate change can be achieved by uh, comprehensive forward thinking and community minded planning. The department has the potential to create long lasting positive impacts of our physical, social, and natural environments. And it is our goal to realize this potential. However, this can only be achieved through a critical review of its operations. Uh, I feel I speak for uh, all of my uh, council members and colleagues present when I say we look forward to a very productive uh, conversation. Uh, and that concludes my opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, for allowing me to uh, read that for the record. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Moya. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Lago, for your, uh, for your statement. Um, and so, uh, I'm going to start with you know some of my questions here. Um, at the preliminary budget hearing conducted last March, the council requested a list of the rena remaining uh, neighborhood rezoning plans, uh, and the neighborhood rezonings uh, that DCP expected to certify before the end of, of this administration. Um, and in response to this request, uh, the department stated that in light of COVID-19 crisis, it was going to perform a reevaluation of those projects to be certified by the end of the term. Uh, so um, just curious, which projects does the department expect to certify before the end of this current administration's term? Thank you, Chair Salamanca. There are two neighborhood rezonings that we intend to certify before the end of this term. We were prepared to have certified a rezoning of Gowanus, a high opportunity neighborhood with good mass transit and one that has benefited from years of planning with the community and with the two affected council members. We had been prepared to certify that earlier this year, but as you may know, um, a group has sued to prevent the certification. Um, this move was opposed by the community board and many neighborhood organizations that had worked with us in developing the plan. Um, I'll note it was significant that some groups that still had questions about the plan nonetheless opposed the litigation because they wanted the public review process to begin so that there could be a very formal public discussion and refinement of the plan. The second neighborhood rezoning that we anticipate will be certified this year is the plan for Soho Noho. It is one of the city's wealthiest neighborhoods. It is one that sits astride multiple subway lines. And it is an area that has anachronistic zoning that reflects an economy, a neighborhood that has changed. We have worked hand in glove with Council Member Chin, Borough President Brewer, a host of neighborhood organizations um, to develop a Envision Soho NoHo report, which was put together by an advisory group um, under the auspices of the council member, the borough president, and myself. And we look forward to later this year entering and completing the Euler process for the rezoning of these important neighborhoods. Um, I know with these rezonings, normally there comes capital dollars, capital improvements that are attached uh, to them. Uh, what is the total capital? What's the total dollar amount in terms of capital commitments uh, that the that this administration um, is planning to um, commit to for Gowanus? 
That is still being discussed. And in particular, um, the capital commitments are looking towards the, um, the environmental needs of this low-lying and flood-prone neighborhood, as well as looking at the NYCHA campuses that are part of the Gowanus neighborhood. I do not have a firm number on that. And with respect to Soho NoHo, there we have not broached those discussions. What was the total uh, capital investment uh, allocated for the rezonings that were approved? You have East New York, you have Inwood, you have Jerome Avenue. Uh, can you give me specifics how much uh, was allocated for East New York, Jerome, and, um, and Inwood? Um, I am glad to provide that, as well as downtown Far Rockaway and Bay Street as well, which were other of the rezonings. What, when the um, commitments are made, at that point, the Mayor's Office of Operation maintains a commitment tracker of the commitments that are made, and this is publicly accessible. Um, in total, with the six rezonings that we just went through, there has been a total of just up, of over $670 million, but I'd be glad to provide the breakdown for you, Chair. Sure. Yeah, how soon can I get that breakdown? I, we can get it for you this afternoon. That would be great. Just curious to know what yep. each result like received. Um, in uh, fiscal year uh, 2021, in the mayor's preliminary uh, management report, uh, it stated that to date, 167,000 affordable housing units have been created or preserved. Um, in your estimate, if all 15 rezonings projects, if they were implemented, how many additional units of affordable housing would be produced under the Housing New York plan? Well, council member, I'd focus on the rezonings that occurred. Um, and we, that, we don't do a theoretical calculation, not knowing what neighborhoods we could provide our estimates, certainly for Gowanus as well. And then we're also working on our estimates for Soho Noho. Um, the estimates come out of the years of detailed work with the community to determine um, what housing can, can, what amount of housing is appropriate and where the opportunities are. That's fair, that's fair. Um, okay, so the six rezonings that were approved, um, how many affordable housing units were, were produced out of these six rezonings? I can get you, again, those numbers. And if it would be helpful, we could provide the units that we were, we believed would result over time. Because as you know, council member, a neighborhood rezoning plays itself out, not over weeks or months, but over years. Um, a planning horizon of five, 10 and 20 years. The other, if it would be helpful, is we could look to see the number of units that have received permits. Again, some of these rezonings with Bay Street being the most recent are in planning terms, incredibly new rezonings, but we'd be glad to get that information for you. How soon can I get that? Again, we will be providing them in the next day or two. So you don't, you don't, on hand, you don't have how many affordable housing units were created at East New York? Um, not at hand, council member, but again, we'll gladly provide it promptly. So these rezonings, they're multi-agency studies. Um, it's not just a rezoning, it's a study that's attached to it. Right. Um, a neighborhood plan. A neighborhood plan. What's the average cost for a neighborhood plan? Um, the neighborhood plan actually is comprised of two different types of costs. One is the staff time, the use of the department staff, but I'd also note, as you just mentioned, 
the panoply of agencies that we work with, um, from transportation to parks to health and mental hygiene to NYPD, um, all of which invest their staff time in these significant year-long undertaking. Um, the other is the cost of the environmental review, and that is an out-of-pocket review. Um, we estimate that for a significant neighborhood rezoning, the cost of the EIS, depending upon the size, depending upon the complexity, would range from around one and a half to $3 million. Okay, so, I mean, Commissioner, when you sit down and you plan a neighborhood uh, study, um, I'm gonna use, uh, um, you know, Jerome Avenue because that, you know, that, that got approved. Um, does, does OMB not sit down and analyze what the total cost of putting this together, what's the actual total cost, staff time, you know, getting permits to, to have meetings, uh, you know, other expenses. Is, is that not something that your agency or OMB tracks? What we do is we determine our work program, council member. Um, we prioritize working on neighborhoods where we see that there are the ingredients for a successful neighborhood plan and rezoning. And these ingredients include access to transit. We know that we are a city that defines transit-oriented development. It also includes seeing the opportunity of underutilized land that would be appropriate for housing development or um, construction of buildings for jobs. And then finally, another key factor is a council member um, a community board that wants to work with us. And I think your mention of Jerome is particularly apt because council member Gibson worked with us and with us, I mean the panoply of city agencies hand in glove throughout the process. Council member Cabrera, when he became aware of the work that we were doing in council member Gibson's portion of Jerome asked if we could extend the study area to include a portion of his district along the corridor, which we gladly did. And um, those are the makings of a successful neighborhood plan. I'm, I don't- I'm sorry, I'm sorry Chair, I, I, I have to interject here because I, I understand you're, 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 you're explaining to me, you know, that these council members wanted these uh, rezonings and these studies. I understand that. I'm trying to find out what the cost is for these studies. You know, when you look at where we're, this is a budget hearing, you know, and I'm trying to find out how city planning is utilizing their budget. And, you know, there's a forty two million dollar uh, budget that city planning is proposing for fiscal year 22. And I want to know how you're spending that money. And so I want to know what's the total cost of a neighborhood study. Again, council member, it is we choose which neighborhood studies we can undertake. We know that we can undertake an infinite number of them, um, in part because many council members have districts that aren't ripe for this type of intensive is look. Fair, is it fair to say that you're not keeping track of what the total cost of uh, the Jerome Avenue uh, study, what it cost? Because you're not giving me a number, which I have to assume that you're not keeping track of what the total cost of that study was. We can attempt to estimate the staffing, but council member, it's not that we say we have this many dollars to spend on this study. We prioritize work depending upon the needs of the city. Um, there are very different costs across the neighborhood studies. Some are more complex, some are more straightforward. I'll also note that we are nimble in prioritizing where the resources that the council gives us get allocated. Um, you will have seen that yesterday, the mayor announced these four citywide zoning initiatives, these zoning text amendments, all of which are geared at our, the city's recovery from the pandemic. That was our being able nimbly to direct our work program to meet what we believe are the crying issues of the day. All right, 
I, I'm Commissioner Lago. I'm, I'm asking very specific questions, and I'm not getting answers. I want to know what's the cost of a neighborhood study, um, and it seems that your your agency is not keeping track of that. Um, in terms of outside consultants for neighborhood studies, do you utilize outside consultants? We utilize outside consultants um, to perform the environmental impact statement. Okay, so and that's the one point three, the one point five to three million dollars for that EIS, correct? Yes. All right, we got a number there. Okay. Um, you have to excuse me here because I'm just trying to get. All right. So my next round of questions is in regards to the neighborhood development fund. Um, when in 2015, when the administration uh, committed to 15 rezonings over the life of, you know, uh, of this administration, um, there was a commitment of $1 billion in capital spending. Uh, the fund was meant to ensure that capital dollars would flow into these neighborhoods upon the completion of rezoning. Um, of the $1 billion, how much is left um, after only uh, six of the 15 rezonings were approved? Certainly. Um, with respect to the NDF, it, the $1 billion is comprised of two different buckets. Um, one with respect to DEP work and the other with respect to non-DEP. Um, there is currently remaining around $350 million. Okay. All right. And... Uh, I can only assume that that 350 that's left over is going to be allocated to the two rezonings that uh, your, this administration is trying to uh, finalize, the Gowanus and Soho Noho? Certainly with respect to Gowanus, and as I had mentioned earlier, Chair, um, we have not engaged in discussions about capital allocations in connection with the Soho Noho rezoning. All right. Um, I'm going to move along here. Um, you know, these are rezonings, um, and I'll go back to Jerome uh, or Inwood or East New York. Um, you know, the, the rezonings added density to these communities where you're going to bring in hundreds, if not thousands of new units of housing. Um, and my question is, as part of this process of these rezonings, um, I, I'm interested in knowing about support support services. Um, are support services part of those conversations such as public safety, the fire department, police department, EMS, uh, schools, school seats, right? Um, healthcare, um, you know, ensuring that we have the appropriate health facilities. Uh, and most importantly for communities such as Jerome, and I imagine Inwood in East New York, food pantries, right? At, at the moment, you know, they're being exacerbated and you're adding more people to the communities, which in essence, you know, will lead to um, some of these food pantries now requiring more resources. So, when, you're putting these, when, you're, when you're putting these rezonings together, are you, are, is city planning talking with other city agencies ensuring that you are adding funding uh, to these support services? The plan is developed with that full panoply of city agencies that you mentioned, from things that one would think of as front of mind, like um, a DOT, um, Parks and Recreation, but it extends to the other types of service agencies that you mentioned, like the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, um, like the libraries. Um, and I, I'm so glad that you had mentioned the food pantries, because again, another inequity brought to the fore even more starkly by the pandemic is the food insecurity in many of the neighborhoods. And that is why the department is so proud to have been a major contributor to the food plan that was recently released. The Jerome Avenue, well, it, it just got uh, uh, approved. So I, there's, you know, I, I don't know if they're building, um, if there's construction happening now. Uh, but East New York, at least I know, that's one of the projects that got approved when I first came to the council five years ago. Um, and I know that there's been housing that's affordable housing that's being built there. Um, can you, does, 
the city plan to keep track in terms of were there extra programs or extra resources that were added in terms of program resources to, to East New York as a result of the uh, density that was added because of the rezoning? Certainly. Um, and I think that it is wise chair to focus on the East New York because it's the earliest of them and so has had the most time to come to fruition with affordable housing under construction with the Atlantic Avenue median having been reconstructed, making that boulevard so much safer with City Line Park being um, fundamentally rehabbed into a, a gorgeous new space. But with respect to programs, as part of the East New York rezoning, um, there was identified the fact that there was an underutilized former courthouse, a beautiful historic building. Um, and that building was rehabbed into a NYPD sponsored youth center. Um, it is already up and running and it is allowing the neighborhood youth to interact with PD in such a productive way from basketball leagues to art classes, to computer training, to um, Taekwondo classes. I'll also note in connection with the East New York uh, rezoning that a new school was built as well. So you can see the diversity of the agencies and the resources that were brought to this long underserved neighborhood. Okay. All right, I, um, I'm going to hand off uh, my, some questions over to my uh, colleagues, the chairs. I'm going to allow uh, Chair Moya. Uh, to, uh, Chair Moya, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Chair Salamanca. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, I, I, I want to just quickly ask you, uh, if you, you, you talked a little bit about Gowanus and Soho. Um, can you quickly describe what elements of the where we live report were uh, you're actively implementing and hope to complete by the end of this administration? Uh, certainly. Um, the, you mentioned actually one of the key facets, which is looking at um, rezonings that would create new affordable housing, mixed income housing in high opportunity neighborhoods, um, which Gowanus and Soho NoHo certainly are. The second is that we agreed to um, providing a set of analyses of citywide trends in housing growth and loss. Um, we actually recently issued an information brief on net changing, not net changes in housing. Um, and again, this is publicly available information. Um, this year, we're going to do an additional piece of analysis, which is we're going to assess the extent to which new housing and affordable housing have been created in higher income versus lower income neighborhoods. Um, we also have work underway looking at whether there are opportunities in lower density zoning districts to create a wider variety of unit types and low cost housing. Um, so this is a, a series of analytical work that we'll be undertaking that we committed to undertake as part of the Where We Live initiative. I will note that this is entirely consistent with our approach at the department to our land use planning, which is that we are very, very fact-based. Um, it is why, you, as, as the, the members of the committee certainly know, we have a population division um, that is a world-class world demographic unit that was tremendously involved in the recent census. In fact, the head of it, uh, Dr. Joe Salvo, was instrumental in beating back in the courts the Trump administration's proposal to include a citizenship question. We need to have this kind of demographic data and analysis to inform our planning. So we welcomed undertaking these commitments in the Where We Live study. Okay, and, and one of the recommendations of the Where We Live uh, report on fair housing is to increase the housing opportunity, particularly in low income uh, areas, especially in amenity rich neighborhoods. Uh, Gowanus and Soho are only two neighborhoods 
Uh, how does DCP envision accomplishing this goal at scale? And is it possible to truly accomplish this goal under the current uh, planning system? Um, it is, we can accomplish it at scale using a number of tools. I, I would um, focus on citywide policy changes um, in the way that MIH and ZQA were this administration's early and extremely progressive and effective moves to change citywide policy. The second is more local initiatives. Um, the, we see a steady stream of private applications uh, where there is long underutilized land near transit that is appropriate for an upzoning. And with that upzoning comes MIH, the requirement for permanently affordable housing. The other thing that I would note, council member, is that um, as of right development is part of the equation. In our city, we estimate that 80% of housing that is built is built as a matter of right. It doesn't attract the attention usually or the controversy that a neighborhood rezoning might, but it is an effective tool for producing housing. Um, the, I think one of the challenges under the current system that we do have to acknowledge is that um, we have been fortunate in the rezonings in each of the neighborhood rezonings to have had council members who have been ardent supporters of their neighborhoods um, and looking for properly for the capital investment and services that are appropriate for the increased density that comes with the rezoning. But the, we know that there are other neighborhoods where there could be the possibility of a neighborhood plan to appropriately increase density, but where opposition from the neighborhood and in particular opposition from a council member would make uh, pursuing such a rezoning not a wise use, use of our resources. So uh, how does DCP then, um, uh, how are you wor uh, working actively uh, in order to desegregate residential neighborhoods uh, where the demographic composition is the result of decades of exclusionary zoning and housing policy? Um, you had mentioned earlier, Chair, the Where We Live initiative. That is the city's multi-layered approach that goes beyond just land use. Powerful as land use is, it's not the only tool. Um, rezoning through MIH is clearly one of the tools. Um, the other is that as of right development that uses current state programs is another tool that is producing mixed income housing in many neighborhoods around the city. And so I, I just wanna go back to something you said in the beginning. You, so you said that uh, under the current administration, you believe that the MIH uh, policy that has been set is working uh, 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 that it's it, that it's working fairly in order to accomplish uh, the goals that are set um, uh, for this planning system. Is that is that is that did I hear you correctly when you said that? Uh, MIH, we believe, at the time of adoption, was absolutely groundbreaking, and it was coupled with zoning for quality and affordability, which removed barriers to the creation of affordable housing. It doesn't attract as much attention, but I'll note that by um, removing the requirement for parking for the affordable units in a transit zone, that just changed the um, equation, um, the financial equation for producing affordable housing. The fact that MIH has been mapped already in 39 of our council districts in a short number of years is significant. The other facet of MIH that is frequently overlooked is um, the way it works in a neighborhood like West Chelsea. There is a project that goes by the pretty boring name of block 675. It is a block just south of Hudson Yards 
And we were able there to map MIH without the need for city subsidy. Um, and so if we look at the fact that we adopted a citywide program and that in less than an administration, have it working in 39 of our city's districts, this is a successful program. Okay, I just, wanted to, I just wanted to hear that you think that this is a successful program and that through MIH, you're going to be able to uh, accomplish uh, the goals that were set under uh, this planning system of uh, the Where We Live report, correct, right? MIH together with other city tools. And again, I would note that a key challenge that we have to keep our eyes open to is that we have a system where the um, a proposal for rezoning requires the support of the local council member. And that, that again, can be a challenge in um, undertaking rezonings. We've been so fortunate. The system itself, uh, the way it was supposed to come in should have been the floor, not the ceiling, because that's what we see every single time uh, there is a rezoning that comes through our committee. And so uh, to me, I just wanted to uh, hear you say that you believe that this is a successful uh, program that is bringing in uh, affordable housing uh, all across New York City, correct? In, thir in 39 of the 59 districts where we have mapped it, Council uh, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Moving on, DCP recently uh, released data on citywide housing production from 2010 to 2020 that shows that many of the city's neighborhoods with the most overcrowded housing, such as Sunset Park, Ozone Park, and Corona, uh, Queens, which is my district, had little to no new housing production during this period. Does DCP have a strategy uh, for addressing overcrowding, uh, overcrowded housing in middle density working class uh, immigrant neighborhoods? Thank you for raising these neighborhoods, council member, because we believe that it is not just high density neighborhoods where additional housing is needed. We would so welcome working with you in Corona to identify appropriate corridors because the neighborhood does benefit from subway access and to identify sites that would be appropriate. Um, as I mentioned, one of the areas that we committed to look at under where we live is what kinds of tools might be available to create, for example, an accessory dwelling unit. We know that there is such a variety of neighborhoods throughout the city and the approach towards meeting the city's housing need can't be a one size fits all. Um, given the crowding in Corona, we would very much welcome undertaking this type of planning discussion with you. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, so understanding that we, that we need more housing units uh, to help alleviate the overcrowding, uh, is, the uh, is the creation of additional housing units the only tool that DCP believes uh, is within its power to address the phenomenon of uh, overcrowded residential units? Again, I, I never think that land use is the only tool council member. We work hand in glove with other city agencies. Um, it would be an odd day where our team is not engaged with HPD, with EDC. The way to address an issue as intractable in this city as housing and particularly affordable housing is not just with one tool. We're proud of the land use tools that we have. As I hope is evident, we are proud of MIH and ZQA, but we need more of that. Um, we also can look proudly on the, some of the initiatives that the city has undertaken, like a right to counsel. These are all part of a web of programs that are needed to address a major challenge, which is the affordability of housing. Okay, so how does DCP determine what levels of housing construction is necessary to make market rate housing affordable to working families? And is there a study that you can share with the city council to help provide more clarity on this issue? 
there are any number of academic studies that have looked at this issue. The one thing I would note, Chair, is that um, it, it seems hard even to articulate how not producing housing would increase affordability. Um, another part of the housing puzzle that I should have mentioned is actually the importance of connecting New Yorkers to good jobs, because obviously a good job allows one, uh, gives one a better shot of being able to afford appropriate housing. And I am um, trying to um, keep my opening remarks um, short, I didn't address some of the job creating projects that will be coming before the council this year. I'll note a proposal that we expect will be entering Ulop soon for Wildflower Studios in Queens. Um, it is a major investment in a portion of our economy of which we're very proud, our, our role in the media and entertainment economy. And the fact that this will be a ground up studio um, built in an appropriately zoned area of Queens that will also entail environmental remediation along the waterfront just strikes us as a win. And I believe that um, the estimate is that Wildflower Studios, this, this facility, will have a thousand permanent jobs. Okay. Um, so how does uh, affordable housing production through MIH uh, and HPD sponsored projects reflect the data on affordable housing applications in terms of the unit mix? I'm afraid that on unit mix, I would have to refer you to HPD. That, that is not something that the, um, the Department of the Commission gets into. Okay, how about uh, what is the percentage of affordable housing applications uh, that apply for studio one bedrooms, two bedrooms, apartments, uh, and how does that uh, affordable housing supply match that demand? I'm afraid that I'm going to have to refer you to, to HPD. That would be the agency with jurisdiction over this chair. Okay. Uh, does the department believe that there should be at least a minimal residential uh, unit size uh, prescribed for affordable housing uh, to adequately meet the needs of families that live in intergener intergenerational houses? Um, having grown up in an intergenerational household, I, um, I know the tremendous value of it. But again, I, I apologize. We, through our zoning, look to allow for a range of unit sizes to meet a range of needs. But with respect to the data that you're asking for, I would have to defer to HPD. Okay. Um, how about, maybe you can answer this. Well, what is DCP's policy response to the loss of housing units in affluent neighborhoods like the Upper East Side, Upper West Side, and the West Village? And do you believe that this phenomenon has uh, a fair housing implication? I actually, we were pleased to be able to put out the data about the loss of units and to start the public discussion about that. And again, I do think that it will require conversations with neighborhoods and with council members about the appropriateness of looking to site additional housing where appropriate in transit rich neighborhoods like the ones that you mentioned. I will note that um, portions of the Upper West Side have created a significant amount of housing, um, although at, while at the same time recognizing that there was in um, that neighborhood a loss of units due to alterations, the type of alterations that you mentioned. Um, so why do you think that housing construction is concentrated in only a few neighborhoods in the city? I actually, um, Chair, with respect, have to take, um, have to disagree with that premise. We have seen a lot of housing that was constructed as a result of rezonings in the prior decade and in the prior administration in areas that had previously been long abandoned manufacturing areas. So there was very little residential uh, construction in those neighborhoods, um, places like Long Island City, Hudson Yards, Greenpoint, Williamsburg. Right, but during this um, administration, 
let's let's that, let's let's talk specifically that because if you're going to talk about Long Island City, if you're going to talk about manufacturing, you know, uh, the study that was done on Long Island City said there was only going to be you know a displacement of uh, maybe 700 uh, uh, units. It turned out to be uh, more like 80,000. So like, I think there's a big discrepancy on the studies that have been done uh, when you talk about you know, manufacturing and how much that's actually uh, uh, produced in terms of uh, affordability. So I just wanted to, to know, uh, because I, I wanna give my uh, colleagues you know, an opportunity uh, to ask questions too, but it, under this current administration, uh, why do you think the construction has only been concentrated in just a few neighborhoods in the city? And is it an intentional outcome of, of a DCP's planning and zoning policy? Uh, again, Chair, the units that have been constructed during this administration's tenure, many of them are the result of zoning that was adopted years ago, in the same way that the rezonings that we are that we have adopted in this administration will unfold over 10 and 20 years. Um, a rezoning is not an on-off switch. It unfolds over time. The other thing that I'll note is that there has been significant new housing construction in many transit accessible neighborhoods, not just in a handful of them. It's a reflection of the fact that our city has for years been focused on transit-oriented development. And then the final thing that I'll note is that in 2018, um, we did an analysis that showed that roughly 80% of new housing in that decade was built as of right. Um, that is the housing that gets built without the attention that is attendant to a neighborhood rezoning, but frequently is a result of a rezoning in a prior administration. Um, so how, how does, um, I'm going to wrap up. So how does the the 10 year capital strategy ensure sufficient infrastructure spending that matches the reality of the majority of housing construction being concentrated in these uh, few neighborhoods? Uh, uh, again, Chair, I'm sorry to have to, I disagree with the premise that it's concentrated in a few neighborhoods. We see the housing construction across the city, but um, I, I wanna thank you for raising the 10 year capital strategy. We have during this administration, the uh, Department of City Planning with our Capital Planning Division and OMB have markedly improved um, the way in which we undertake the 10 year capital strategy. The community district statement of needs process has been taken out of a paper-based era and into an online portal. We have engaged so extensively with the community board uh, district managers. The other thing that I would note is that um, the Department of City Planning has established a capital planning forum with OMB and the six city agencies that together have the lion's share of the capital planning. And we meet routinely we, to, to see where are the capital planning needs? How can we across the different agencies take a more forward looking planning approach? Uh, okay, so um, I'm just, just uh, uh, yeah, Chair, I'm, 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 this is my last question. So I just wanted to follow up with this. So sure. it, it shows that your own reports show that your concentration is uh, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, uh, downtown Brooklyn, Greenpoint, Williamsburg, Long Island City, you're saying that it's 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 other neighborhoods. But can you point out what other uh, neighborhoods you you're you're uh, referencing right here? Um, off the top of my head, I would note Jamaica as an area where we have seen significant housing construction, um, and basically production has occurred pretty broadly along our subway lines. The, um, many other communities are coming to this oh. awareness so of transit-oriented development, whereas we have just taken this for granted. So, so, so does DCP have like uh, actual uh, studies that show and demonstrate that there is this kind of robust uh, housing construction that is being done in other neighborhoods outside of the ones that I just mentioned here? Yes, we, we, um, we can track via um, the 
Department of Building. Another example that I would give is downtown Brooklyn, an area that has seen significant growth and growth in a way that we think is so beneficial because employers have taken note of the concentration of new residents and so are looking at this neighborhood as a convenient live, work, play neighborhood. We as planners find that to be um, beneficial because it relieves stress on the subway. And um, we can um, give to you following this meeting, we have an existing, we put out housing information briefs um, and we have them on the production of housing. Um, but again, we're glad to provide this information. We already have it in a housing brief and we'll provide it right after this hearing. Great, thank you so much, Chairwoman. And I appreciate your time. And uh, thank you to uh, Chair Salamanca and my colleagues. I want to turn it over uh, to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Moya. Um, so we're going to start our first round of questions uh, with our council members, my colleagues. Um, every uh, colleague will have about three minutes to ask their questions. Um, and uh, hopefully we can get to a second round with my colleagues. So if council, if you can call members uh, by the way they had their hands raised. Sure, and Chair, I'll just um, announce myself. I'm Angelina Martinez Rubio, and I'll be taking over as chair for this committee. And so the first council member with his hand up, hand up is council member Powers, followed by council member Barron, and followed by council member Miller. Council member Powers. Starting time. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity here. Nice to see you. Uh, um, I wanted to ask, first of all, I wanted to say just, uh, I just want to commend you guys. I saw the uh, new proposals out about zoning for accessibility and fresh and open streets. And I think those are all good ideas. And I want to uh, echo some support here for those um, that I think were just released. So thank you for thinking about that, especially accessibility in our subway system. I think it's a good idea. And I, I think I did an op-ed on that a few months ago, so I, I appreciate it. Um, I wanted to talk about the future of small businesses here and how they intersect with uh, some of the work, some of the stuff we're talking about here today. As our hospitality industry in New York City has been decimated and looking for uh, lots of help in the recovery, we have, to, of course, have uh, uh, open uh, dining here to uh, allow for that. Um, but one of the, you know, as I was digging into some, a number of the um, regulations guiding over uh, the nightlife industry here in the city. One of them that stuck out to me was a uh, zo zoning resolution uh, restrictions around nightlife establishments, particularly when it comes to so cabaret law-esque um, restrictions on dancing inside of uh, nightlife, which seems to be restricted in a number of areas. And um, which you know, right now as the industry is trying to cover, feels like a good opportunity to revisit those. Um, so I wanted to ask your, your opinion on those regulations and in, in, in some zoning re regulations that exist right now around dancing inside of nightlife establishments um, and would, would ask if you agree with me, because I believe that we should enable business owners to be able to do that. I would be glad to sit down, council member, and go through the specific regulations. Um, Do you have anything else? To, I mean, I, I would, love, you know, we're in a public no, setting. I'd love I, to hear your opinion on the restrictions around I dancing have, in nightlife. Would be so glad to review it. And I say that as a salsa dancer. <laughs> Do you believe that we should remove those regulations when it comes? And council member, I would have to sit down and look at the particular um, reservations, but I come at it with an open mind. Are so you, thank you for raising Are you that. familiar with those regulations? I'm, I'm not familiar with which provisions you're referring to, okay. which is why I'd welcome the ability to discuss with you and other of your colleagues. Okay, so I, I'll just add a, a voice here then that, um, I, as I understand, there's still zoning restrictions that are from the 90, the 90 Giuliani era with the, and that's sort of a, it would be associated, I think, with the cabaret law that puts certain restrictions in commercial air, uh, put certain restrictions on the ability for dancing around nightlife. And it feels as we're looking at a number of ways to help it, that has been raised as one of the issues that we perhaps could do to, if it took, as we're thinking about some of the proposals you put out that we could also, you know, we perhaps associate ourselves with in order to help out these establishments that are struggling right now and certainly feel quite outdated to me. So I'll land you staff um, follow up with that as well. 
Um, what other, um, I'll just ask one last question because I've used all my time talking about helping uh, the nightlife industry. I know Chair Moy, uh, important know, industry. You agreed me on that. Um, uh, I just, one question, just on a zoning for accessibility, uh, which I, I, I think is a, a, a great idea. Can you just give us, uh, you know, I, I, I might have missed your testimony, you may have talked about it. Can you just give us a little more context about that and particularly what the timeline on that might be? And also, I guess what you might anticipate timeline is to see projects come forward that would take advantage of that. Thank you. And I thank you for mentioning the package. I do want to note um, the partnership that we have had with the council on the zoning for accessibility on the expansion of the, of the fresh program um, on um, the, the council support for the open restaurants program. Um, with respect to zoning for accessibility, there are two different provisions um, in there. One, it pertains to um, the reservation of easements for the MTA for future development. Um, this is important in areas of the city where there might not be immediate development pressures, but we can certainly look ahead to a day when every station um, will become accessible. And so we want to make sure that development that occurs near stations doesn't preclude the ability for stations to become accessible. We then look at areas in our high density districts, um, including yours council member, obviously, but also in other of our central business districts and are looking to um, loosen the rules appropriately to expand the applicability of the rules so that they will cover more of more subway stations, um, not just those development sites that are immediately adjacent to a station. As far as the timing of when we will actually see accessible stations, as you know, council member, that is um, dependent upon when the owner of a parcel will seek to redevelop it. But I can tell you that the agency is um, very, very focused on opportunities for increasing access. We are so proud of the instances where we have seen it happen uh, down on Broad Street in Manhattan as a result of private residential development. We are having private owner pay for making the terminus of the J and the Z line accessible. That is so important for access to jobs. I agree, I agree. And I just wanted to just clarify here. So I agree, but I thank you for sharing that. Um, just, just in terms of my original question, it was 1990, the City Planning Commission adopted a citywide am amendment about nightlife establishments that, um, and it's youth group 12, it's allowed in special permits, C2, C3, M1, 5A, M1, 5A, M1, 5M, M1, 6M districts by special permit or as a right in C4, as a right in C6, as a right in C7, C8 and all other M1, 2, and 3 districts is where that is allowed. All other areas, uh, it is not permitted under the zoning resolution, as I understand. Yeah, uh, council member, to turn that, that list into lay terms, basically, um, it, dancing is allowed in regional commercial districts, districts that have a, a more regional draw, and in M districts where it's restricted is in local commercial districts. This restriction actually has some parallels in the physical culture establishment, um, the the gyms and spas provision that we are looking You're to yeah. make as of right, there are some similarities to those restrictions, but there are also some differences, and so that is why I think we would welcome the ability to follow up with you about that. We will follow up, and I just will mention there'll still be a liquor license, of course, application that we'll have to apply here at community boards and community groups will have an opportunity to still express wishes and desires. So with that being said, I'm going to hand it back to Chair Salmak because I've used too much time here already. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you. Thank you to both of you for the time. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. Um, uh, Councilmember Barron, you have the floor. Starting time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the hearing. Thank you to the panel for coming. Um, I've heard the commissioner say that uh, the MIH that this 
oh, I'm so sorry, that the MIH that was established is in fact uh, a great start. I disagree. Uh, we went from what was 80, 20 in our previous uh, administration to 75, 25. When we look at MIH, uh, it says that 25% should be at an average of 60% of the AMI. And when you look at a community such as mine, which is East New York, uh, the AMI, the neighborhood median income in my community is $37,000. So it's not designed at talking about 60% AMI to address the majority of the people who live in this community. Uh, we also know that the federal government, when it re released its report, I believe it was 1995, which talked about cre creating housing around transit rich hubs, stated that it, it uh, causes displacement. So what we are seeing is that we are having development that is resulting in displacement. Now in the East New York rezoning plan, there were 6,000 units that were targeted to be developed over the time that this plan is implemented. At the outset, 3,000 of those units were designated as market rate. So you're starting at only half of what the uh, plan said would be created uh, during this housing plan, this housing phase. And then of those that were left, when we did the analysis based on the uh, AMIs that would be targeted for the housing coming in, the salary that would be required, it resulted in only 10% of the present population being qualified to uh, be able to apply for the housing that was coming in. Even when those apartments in that plan are targeted at particular uh, area median incomes or the incomes for the communities, the ripple effect is that the blocks beyond what was designated as that zone begin to now raise their prices raise the rents for the people that are living in those homes, raise the prices of the homes that owners are themselves selling. So what we are seeing in East New York in that portion I'm that expired. has been rezoned, thank you, Mr. Chair, if I could continue, is that the people have been displaced and are being displaced because of that uh, East New York rezoning that came in. In my portion of East New York, where we have been fighting and working with developers to make sure that if they're coming before the council, that they have some set-asides for homeless, set-asides for people who have uh, other support needs, and that they realize we're not supporting projects that come in at 100 and 130% of the AMI, which is defined as affordable. So my question to you is, how do you justify saying that we've made these great moves and gains when it has in fact resulted in displacement? And one of my colleagues is in fact calling for a follow-up study in terms of whether the EIS statements that are issued in fact, run true to what actually happens after the projects have been developed. Thank you. Thank you, council member. And it's the last time I'm smiling because the last time we saw each other, we were both uh, receiving lifetime achievement age disruptor awards. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, congratulations. <laughs> um, a couple of things. Um, you had mentioned the prior administration's 80-20. Actually, that was a voluntary inclusionary housing program. It was not mandatory. And in many places where VIH, voluntary inclusionary housing, was a possible tool, in fact, it has not been used. And so the difference is that MIH is mandatory. I'll note that MIH is only one tool that we have. Um, PA, HPD frequently augments it. And, um, and in particular, um, 
on city-owned land. Mm -hmm. Actually, one other thing that I'll note is VIH did not require permanent affordability. It was only for a term of years. MIH um, requires permanent affordability. That is one of the very um, progressive statements. Um, the other thing that I'll note is that in East New York, we are not seeing market rate housing. The housing that has been produced, it has been 100% affordable housing. And given the, um, the, given the commitment of HPD, the resources that have been poured into the neighborhood, we are pleased to see the 100% affordable housing that is being constructed on Ch uh, Chestnut Dinsmore, the school that is being constructed. So I don't wanna pretend that MIH is the only tool, but we do think that it is powerful because it is citywide and is designed to operate in a variety of neighborhoods. Thank you. And just to, just to clarify, uh, I believe that the plan called for the affordable housing uh, to be developed first. So that's in accordance with the timetable that was established. But thank you for your response. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate the extra time. You got it. You got it, Councilmember Byron. Thank you. Um, so up next, we have Councilmember Miller for questions. Out in time. Councilmember Miller, you're muted. Councilmember Miller. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. How are you? You're, you're I'm, up I'm doing department. very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership, man. We, we so appreciate you um, and, and my colleagues and for, for the re very relevant questions that are being asked about development, future of development here in, in New York City. Um, you know, obviously, uh, uh, the member just, uh, uh, Councilmember Barron just, just, just spoke of, of, of uh, the, the impact studies uh, on, on communities of color and, and, and what we've seen with these rezonings and, and also, you know, was mentioned about uh, the lack of investment. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, you mentioned Jamaica as being one of those places. Um, and, and, I, and I'm really glad uh, that you did uh, recognize the development that is happening, but the development that happens in Jamaica happens with very little uh, or, or a not equitable um, city participation. It doesn't get the type of resources that obviously those uh, emerging waterfront communities such as Greenpoint and Long Island City and and, and Sunset Park and, and and places like that, um, those emerging emerging waterfront and gentrifying communities. Might, I, I might add, and so the I'd love to see equity in 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 the uh, investment because there there is uh, like we really really struggle to make these projects happen in Jamaica, and, and it takes a lot of creativity and a lot of effort on all levels when we don't get the, the, the same of amount of investment. In fact, there's only one HPD project of the many projects that is uh, uh, occurring. And um, we, you know, that was pulling teeth and, you know, it's, it's, it's just been really difficult. One of the things that, that I, I wanna add is that um, as we plan uh, out, is there any, uh, are we budgeting for the additional infrastructure that occurs uh, that is needed in a location such as Jamaica, considering um, high water ties that the, the greater Jamaica area uh, has suffered for decades uh, from, from flooding and, and, and lack of infrastructure um, in, in, in the surrounding areas, uh, nearly uh, a third of all the city's infrastructure budget is, is spent in, in the greater Jamaica area, which does not include the downtown area. And what we're noticing on a number of recent projects is that uh, developers are now in the midst of, in, in the middle of development are being asked to uh, contribute to uh, infrastructure. And, 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 and in some cases not even the, the, the uh, sewer systems or the infrastructure just um, connected to their properties or their development that they've been going uh, well I'm beyond expired. in some cases 
uh, 20,000 uh, square feet they were asked to extend out to. And, and there's a problem because you didn't ask Hudson, Hudson Yards and other places to do it there. And ultimately, if you tack on 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars to the cost of the project, then it's no longer affordable housing, um, which would certainly change the context of, of communities and, and the project. What kind of investment can we see in communities such as Jamaica and, and other communities from the city uh, to support development of affordable housing? Thank you for the raising the, the web of issues. Um, I will note that with respect to Jamaica, um, early on in the this administration, the Jamaica Now Plan was released, and that is a very helpful guide um, with respect to investments in this neighborhood that has such great transit access. Um, and where we've seen in the downtown um, housing being produced. Um, I'll also note um, that the type of coordination issues that you mentioned are part of why we are so proud that in this administration, uh, we markedly enhanced city planning's role in capital planning, working with OMB. And um, as I had mentioned earlier, um, we have established a capital planning form where city planning calls together OMB and the six agencies that have the lion's share of the capital budget. And obviously it includes DEP and DOT. And we have these quarterly fora where we can work with the other agencies to identify where there are areas of potential overlap so that we don't have DEP opening up a road only to find, or have DOT repave a road only to find that a year later, DEP had planned um, to need to rip up the road, but also looking forward proactively to be able to identify what needs are arising. The other invaluable source for us is the community district statement of needs process. And by bringing it online, by city planning working so closely with the district managers in the community boards, um, we have found that the responses that we are getting are no longer all too frequently just a cut and paste of last year's submission, but actually a very considered view of what the needs of the community are. So in, in that case, it just, just where, we, where we recognize that the infrastructure is woefully insufficient. Uh, is it, do we anticipate in the future that that is the responsibility of the developer and not the city to provide infrastructure? In downtown Jamaica, York College is pumping 80,000 gallons of water per day out of that, out of their, their main building. So that's just indicative of, of what it's like. And, you know, that's where you want to build in the transportation hub. But unfortunately, uh, we need infrastructure to support. How, how do we balance that in the current budgetary environment? We would be glad to follow up with you, council member. Okay, thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, council member um, Miller. Thank um, you, Mr. Chair. Um, Chair Lago, I had, now that um, you spoke about community boards, um, the ULERP application process is becoming more complicated um, as more programs are being created through the zoning resolution. Um, how do the trainings for community board members evolve with the rise of more complex ULERP applications? Thank you for that question, Chair. And um, I have to thank the council when I had my first budget hearing when I first took this job, the question was raised about community board um, trainings and the inadequacy of them. We took the prod from the council to heart and we went back and looked at the trainings that we provided and have so markedly upped our game on this. We provide leadership training to the leadership of the community board and the land use chairs and the district managers. And that is a soup to nuts training uh, on the ULERP process. Back when we could meet in person, 
we actually did it in our hearing room so we could bring these community board leaders from across the city together and found um, we certainly benefited from it. And the feedback that we got was that they benefited from meeting with their counterparts from other community boards. In addition, we do trainings for every community board members, not just the leadership. And we do those, those are handled by our borough offices who have, um, who, who are more aware of the nature of the issues that are affecting the community boards in their districts. And we're especially heartened that some borough presidents choose to co-host these trainings with us. Um, it's a trend that we hope will continue and perhaps take hold even more broadly. When was this training done in the Bronx? When was, when was this training last done in the Bronx? I, I'll get you the date of it, council member. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, I, 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 I was a district manager five years ago um, and um, I really, I, I think that was one of the biggest challenges for me as a district manager was navigating these complex ULERP applications. Um, and, and something that was extremely challenging for me uh, as a DM was MIH. Uh, that was my last year uh, as, as a DM. And then I came in and I, and I got to vote on it as a council member. But as a DM, just to be clear, the whoever the city, whoever the administration sent to educate my community board did not do a very good job explaining to us what MIH and ZQA actually did. And, um, and that's why there was such a large percentage of Bronx community boards that voted no. Uh, for for MIH, um, so I'm, I'm just curious to that. Um, is it possible that you can provide us this committee with materials used to brief community board members on ULIP applications? Uh, gladly, we can provide our training materials. Okay, thank you. Um, next up, we have uh, Council Member Gradenchik. He had his hand up for some questions. Morning, Todd. Council Member Gradenchik, are you there? I'm here. I'm here. All right, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, uh, Chair. And uh, it's uh, I get to see Chair Lago with two weeks in a row. It's quite unusual for us. Uh, <laughs> my second um, my second land use issue sailed through Chair Moyer's subcommittee today, so I'm grateful for that. I just want to add my voice to some of my colleagues. Um, I have been in government a, a relatively long time. Uh, worked with uh, great people um, like Claire Shulman. Uh, Helen Marshall, Melinda Catstreet, uh, Borough Presidents, dealt with land use issues as a staffer for the late great uh, Nettie Mayerson as well, dealing with the um, what really became a disaster for our community infill zoning, um, which was well intended by Mayor Koch, but um, kind of destroyed a few of our communities. Um, but I, I do want to say that um, the lag time that it takes, and this is not city planning's fault, but the lag time that it can take to get anything done in this city. Um, you know, I just met last week on an infrastructure project that um, has to do with Southeast Queens flooding that um, my colleague, uh, uh, Danique Miller is very aware of, um, and uh, uh, Councilwoman Adams is also well aware of, and our new borough president, Donovan Richards, but it also deals with sanitary sewers and water and all that. And some of it has been delayed by COVID, but uh, the truth is that these projects take forever. And um, I just wanna voice a concern, something for you to keep in your mind, um, uh, that it just takes so long and the impacts of communities um, can be so great. Not so much my community because you know we're relatively low rise, but even out here, because of cycles in population, I'm building 2,600 new school seats uh, with the great assistance of uh, the former president of School Construction Authority, uh, Ms. Grillo. But um, that's something to keep in mind as we, as we go forward. Um, the, that the planning, I know you know this, but I just wanted to put it on the record, it has to be logical. Um, and it has to be on so many different levels as you talked about before. Um, you know, everything from DEP to the Department of Education to um, the fire department, police department, HPD, and on and on and on. Um, and of course, the local communities as well. So I just wanted to put that on the record, Mr. Chairman, and I'm not going to ask any questions 
And I want to thank you again for your work. And thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, again. I want to thank you, Council Member, for um, mentioning the current and past Queensboro presidents. I had the incredible good fortune earlier in my career to work with Borough President Shulman on the U.S. tennis um, uh, And you must have passed my office at one time just... because that's where I met Lorraine Grillo. It was the first time I met her. Um, she was working on that issue. And, um, you know, it was, uh, that thing was died on the operating table several times, as you probably remember. But uh, the end result is that uh, we have uh, a magnificent um, facility in Flushing Meadows Corona Park um, that does more for the young people of New York City than the Mets and the Yankees combined, in my opinion, even though I'm a, a huge Met fan and I think they're moving in the right direction. Um, but it really is, it, it was a game changer for New York City in, in so many different ways. Thank you, thank you, I Chief. will use your comment. I, I will use your comment to note that we work hand in glove with um, when she was um, SCA head Grillo um, as part of our planning initiatives and share your high regard for her. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Chair, Dr. and thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Um, before we move on um, to uh, uh, my colleagues for more questions, um, Chair Lago, in fiscal year 2022, going back to the budget questions, in fiscal year 2022 preliminary plan, the Department of City Planning has not identified any new needs, nor does it make any significant spending adjustments for fiscal year 2022 um, and the out years? So my question is, did city planning submit a budget request to OMB? We actually worked very closely with OMB. As I mentioned, I touched upon briefly in my opening remarks, our priority is preserving our resiliency planners with the expiry of the CDBG disaster recovery, the, the post Sandy grant. Um, and so while it may not formally be a new need, that is our priority. All right, so there's, the, so the Department of City Planning does not have any initiatives that it would like to see increased funding. We work with OMB all, time, all the time in the preparation of our budget and we actually, we use our resources to meet the needs of the day. I can hearken back to the announcement yesterday of the four citywide initiatives that council member Powers commented on that are focused on the pressing priority that was identified, which is recovery from the pandemic. Okay, no, I'm just curious. So you're not requesting any increase in your budget? No, okay. we're focused as I mentioned on preserving our resiliency planners. All right. Um, I'm going to move on. Um, I, I have um, I, I, I have Chair Moya, but I got to get to um, Councilmember Adams first, and then we'll get to Chair Moya. Uh, Councilmember Adams, you have the floor. Order in time. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, Madam Chair, it's good to see you again. And I, I really do uh, have to thank you again for keeping in touch with me post the last hearing that we were in together and your input was very, very appreciated. So thank you again. Um, I, I'm just gonna to try to get a little uh, clarity because um, my colleague, Councilmember Miller uh, referred to uh, Jamaica as did my colleague, Councilmember Moya referred to Jamaica. And you referenced our plan. Uh, I happen to be the first co-chair of uh, the Jamaica Now revitalization plan when I was chairperson of community board 12. Uh, and you referenced our plan um, as, as some sort of tool. So I just wanted to drill down just a little bit more with you. How exactly um, has or, uh, or is uh, uh, city planning using that tool uh, as, uh, as a method to go forward with the look for Jamaica, if at all? No, oh, thank you. Um, and I had not realized your authorship of the plan. So congratulations on that. Um, obviously, EDC released the plan, um, which as an attempt of the administration to coordinate catalytic investments in this um, neighborhood, um, both capital and programmatic. And as I had mentioned, we see the capital planning forum that we've established in this administration as being a fabulous tool 
to be able to bring the capital agencies together holistically. Okay, that's great. It, it's also great to hear that uh, that, that plan is actually used elsewhere, um, you know, and out there uh, some, somewhere other than just where you are and, and still focused on it. Uh, and, and I'll also just echo the sentiments of Chair Salamanca uh, with the explanation of MIH um, a, a few years ago when I was chair of board 12, it was very, very difficult communicating uh, that information. And once again, as he said, uh, uh, you know, referring to the Bronx, we too in Queens, and I'm sure you know this, uh, had great difficulty supporting MIH and um, MIH, I think widely uh, was opposed back then. Uh, so going forward, uh, if we can have more cohesion, number one, and more clarity, I think that that would go a very, very long way in assisting our community boards, just, if we, just as we tried to uh, educate them more on the EULA process going forward uh, and the, uh, the workings of city planning and HPD. So thank you very much again for your testimony. Thank you. I, I wasn't around at the time, but I can so empathize. MIH and ZQA were at that time so groundbreaking. Um, and complex proposals. Thanks to the prodding from the council, our training has gotten a lot better. And it's also set a baseline for better engagement. I will note that uh, former Queens Borough President Katz is, uh, was someone who always embraced doing the trainings jointly, which we absolutely welcomed. Um, shortly, the council will have, will have come before it, zoning for coastal resilience. Um, it is a citywide amendment at the scale of MIH. And um, you will, I'm certain in the presentations, learn about the extensive, the years of community outreach. And if you look then at the recommendations that we received from the community boards, I think that they reflect the enhanced level of engagement um, and the very broad support that there is for this resiliency, this coastal flooding um, related text. So I think that we can always get better, but I do think that we have markedly improved. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councilmember Adams. Um, uh, Council uh, Chair Moya, for questions. Thank you, um, uh, Chair. Uh, Thank you, Chair Lego. Uh, so I, I know that uh, Councilwoman Barron uh, had talked about uh, East New York. And I just wanted to go to one of the, the, the topics there, which is the uh, basement apartments. Uh, what, what, what are the conclusions of the East New York basement apartment conversions uh, pilot program and how many units have been created uh, with this program so far? I'm afraid that I would have to defer to HPD on this one. Okay, so this goes through HPD, not DCP. Right, a, a, a HPD is engaged, is the principal owner of, of this initiative. We have not seen um, a, it, it, it's not something that requires a zoning change. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you, Chair Lago, again um, for uh, the time. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Chilago, I, I have more questions regarding the neighborhood rezonings and the cost, uh, because I just can't wrap my head around the fact that um, city planning is not keeping track of what these studies cost. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, so this EIS, right, for these neighborhood rezonings, uh, you said they can cost anywhere between 1.5 mil and $3 million. Who pays for that? What budget line does that money come out of? comes out of city planning's OTPS budget line. So it comes out of your $42.2 million. Right. Two thirds of which is headcount and then the rest is OTPS spending. Okay, so, so we know where, you know, where that EIS uh, funding uh, is yes. coming from. Now, the, the capital, the capital, um, just to go back on, on capital projects, you know, um, something else that I have a difficult time is uh, understanding 
is that this administration understands that every council district has its own independent capital needs, um, whether it's sewage, uh, you know, um, it could be renewing parks, uh, roofs to do, you know, redo our schools. Yet, this administration, um, you know, only, you know, offers these capital needs if we are upzoning or, you know, if we agree to upzone, uh, um, you know, um, communities. Uh, for example, during the Southern Boulevard study uh, component, you know, before I said no to the rezoning component, um, you know, there were conversations on what can we fix, what capital needs we can address. Once I said, um, I'm not interested in the zoning component of the study, they stopped calling. The, those, all, those capital, all those capital needs, all those capital requests that we were talking about, those conversations just stopped happening. And it was kind of dependent on me now to work with the speaker's office to provide funding for capital needs. Um, do you think that's appropriate that this administration is only focusing on uh, communities that agree to upzoning and if they do not agree with upzonings and then um, those capital dollars don't come to these communities that, that need them? Um, with respect, Chair, I think that the premise is wrong. The NDF was important. I'm not in any way understating the significance of that billion dollar allocation, but the scale of the 10 year capital strategy is a hundred billion. And so there are discussions, there are investments in capital needs across the city entirely unrelated to zoning. Um, we every year go through a capital planning process and identify needs across the city. And again, the overwhelming majority are not in neighborhoods undergoing rezoning. The reason for the NDF was a very specific focus on the capital planning needs arising from a significant increase in neighborhood density. But again, $1 billion out of a $100 billion plan. I, I, I hear you on that. I just, you know, I just find it that it's um, in order for me to get what I need in my community, I have to upzone um, and risk displacement. Um, and um, I, I find that to be wrong, just wrong. Um, I, in the, in the last five years that I've been in office, I, you know, I've said this multiple times, I've approved over 7,000 units of hundred percent affordable housing, 5,000 of those units, uh, you know, new units. Um, and we preserved about, uh, 2000 units. So that's where the 7,000, uh, number comes. Um, and there are communities in my, there are, there are pockets in my, in my, in my community, such as, uh, La Central, who's getting, um, um a little under nine, a little under a thousand units of 100% affordable housing. It's an exciting project. Uh, we're gonna have the Y, we're bringing in commercial, um, uh, a corridor space there. I'm gonna get a nice skate park. I, I'm really excited about that project. Um, but I'm also concerned about supportive services. Uh, there are no conversations about increasing um, public safety in that area. And if you know that area well, you know that 149th Street and Third Avenue is ground zero for opioid use uh, in, in the borough of the Bronx. It's a real challenging problem for us. Um, and it's been going on for decades and it's happening because prior, you know, prior leadership predecessors in the past allowed different not-for-profits that, that catered to that population to, to, to um, open up multiple, um, multiple programs in that area. And so that's why we have uh, a combination of, of, of opioid use in that area. Um, but La Central is almost completed, but there are no conversations about increasing support services. NYPD, uh, fire department, EMS, bringing in more healthcare uh, 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 providers in that area. And my, my question again, and, and I just, is when city planning is approving these projects, that was a, it was a nice size rezoning, but it's not, it was not a rezoning like, you know, we're like a neighborhood rezoning. Is city planning actually having these conversations with other city agencies, um, ensuring that during budget times, they are increasing the services for those immediate communities? We work routinely with the 
alphabet soup of agencies. Um, and we also look to the community district statement of needs as important input. I would be glad to pass along your concerns, but I suspect that you have also directly, Chair. Yeah, I just I just hope that as we move forward with um, you know uh, ULERP applications, um, and I'm going to make this my business. You know, now I'm going to really dig in on this as these applications come through the subcommittees. You know, I'm going to speak to my colleagues, and I'm going to speak to my uh, my colleagues who where these uh, applications are being approved at, and my co-chairs to ensure that you know. Um, we're, you know, we're not just approving these projects just because of affordable housing, but a real comprehensive plan of, you know, supportive services uh, that needs to be attached to these applications has to has to be planned more appropriately. Um, and with that, a uh, council, do we have any other council members with, with, with questions or their hands raised? Uh, no, chair, no other council members with hands up at this time. All right, thank you. So Chair Lago, I wanna thank you and your team for being with us uh, for almost two hours. I really appreciate this candid conversation uh, that we had, thank you. It's always a pleasure, Chair, thank you. Um, and so with that, um, we will be taking a recess and we will resume this meeting at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, for the uh, do it hearing, thank you.
Good afternoon, Chair Holden. Hey, Sergeant, how's everything? All right, I just wanted to get a sound check from you. We hear you loud and clear. Well, thank you. And we should start about two, uh, maybe a couple minutes after, but right okay. around two o'clock. No, thank you. You got it. Robin Levine, I'm going to get a sound trick so we make sure we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, loud and clear. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Tania Richard, if I can get a sound check. Give me one second to unmute you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Is your video working as well? My video, yeah, I it did when I came on. I can, how's that? One sec. All right, I got you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So when you unmute me, then I hit the unmute also. Yes, that you'll be, uh, you'll be uh, instructed by the person that is in charge of muting and unmuting uh, when you're turned to speak. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Tish. I have a sound check, please. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. Hi, how are you? How's everything? Good? Good, thank you. All right. And Janine Gilbert, I need a sound check, please. Can you hear me? I can hear you and see you. Thank you very much. Great. And folks that just joined us, we are currently in recess. We are going to resume around two o'clock. Uh, just keep in mind that we are still recording live on our custom live stream to the council website. So if you could please keep your comments minimal. Thank you.
let me call you back, Mike. Right, all right. All right. Uh, Chair, you are muted. Sergeant of Arms, uh, so you give me, you let me know when we're ready. Uh, Chair Holden, are you ready as well? Ready. All right, folks, we're going to resume our uh, FY22 <clears throat> preliminary budget hearing on the committees of land use jointly with the Committee on Technology. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. So we're going to begin. Uh, we're going to continue our fiscal 2022 prelim preliminary budget hearing on, on Do It on the Department of Information, Technology, and Telecommunications. And I will hand it off to uh, Chair Holden. Uh, thank you, Chair Salamanca, and uh, good afternoon and welcome to the fiscal 2022 preliminary budget hearing for the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunication, known as Do It. I am Council Member Robert Holden, Chair of the New York City Council Committee on Technology. Today's hearing is joint with the Committee on Land Use, and I would like to thank my colleague from the Bronx, Council Member Rafael Salamanca, Chair of the Committee on land use for co-chairing today's hearing with me. The department's proposed fiscal 2022 expense budget totals 699.2 million, including 171.2 million in city funding to support 1,824 full-time positions. The budget also includes 528 million other than personal services of which 248 million is allocated to contractual services. In the preliminary plan, do its current year fiscal 2021 budget of 887.4 million is 188 million more than its fiscal 2022 budget. The significant variance in funding between years is driven by the recognition of additional non-city funding in the current fiscal year a large portion of which is related to COVID-19 expenses. We hope to examine many components of the department's budget at today's hearing, including the department's savings program, new needs, miscellaneous revenue, and capital program. Uh, I would also like to hear about the department's response to the pandemic and receive, a status, uh, receive uh, status updates on the many citywide tech projects the department is currently working on. In particular, the IT infrastructure modernization project, 5G broadband expansion, and next gen 911 and more. City investments in technology should provide long-term benefits for the city to make our city more productive, efficient, and safer. The decision we make or the decisions we make now will be cru uh, critical to how efficiently government operates moving forward. So we look forward to working with Do It to make sure the choices we all make with investments in the city's IT infrastructure and operations are the correct ones. I want to welcome Do It's Commissioner Jessica Tisch and her team. After the testimony, members will have the opportunity to follow up with questions for the commissioner. After that, I hope that the commissioner and staff remain to listen to the public uh, to testify. Um, we are joined, uh, I'd like to recognize uh, council members who are present, Adams, Barron, Borelli, Diaz, Senior, Gredenchek, Moya, Perkins, Riley, and Yeager. Uh, in, uh, in closing, I would like to thank committee staff for working on putting this hearing together, including Florentine Kabor, John Russell, Irene Bohofsky, Charles Kim, and my chief of staff, Daniel Christina. I will now turn it over to our committee counsel, Irene Bohofsky, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair Holden. I'm Irene Bohofsky, the counsel to the Committee on Technology, and I will be moderating this portion of the hearing today. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who will be next, who next panelist will be. 
We will first be hearing testimony from the administration, followed by testimony from the members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you. We will be limiting council member questions to three minutes. We will next call representatives of the administration to testify. We will be hearing testimony from Jessica Tisch, Commissioner of the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications. Additionally, the first Deputy Commissioner, Janine Gilbert, Deputy Commissioner, Joseph Antoinelli, Deputy Commissioner Richards, Assistant Commissioner Robin Levine, Chief of Staff Ryan Melora will be present to answer any questions. At this time, I will administer the affirmation to each representatives of the administration. I will call on each of you individually for response. Please raise your right hands. Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Tisch? I do. Deputy Commissioner Antonelli? I do. Deputy Commissioner Richard? I do. Assistant Commissioner Levine? Uh, I, I do. Mr. Marola? I do. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Tisch. You may begin when ready. Thank okay. you. Good afternoon, Chair Salamanca and Holden, and members of the City Council Committees on Land Use and Technology. My name is Jessica Tisch, and I am the Commissioner of the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, also known as DOIT, and New York City's Chief Information Officer. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about DOIT's fiscal 2022 preliminary budget. With me is Janine Gilbert, DOIT's first Deputy Commissioner, Joseph Antonelli, our Deputy Commissioner of Management and Budget, and Tanya Richard, our Deputy Commissioner of Legal Matters. The past year has been the most professionally challenging and productive year of my career. I became citywide CIO in December of 2019. And three months later, the pandemic hit, bringing tech to the forefront of so many services the city offers. Preparing this budget testimony has given me an opportunity to reflect on all the work of my agency over the past 12 months and the scale, the range, and the breadth of what this team of professionals accomplished are quite emotional for me. That's because the team at Do It immediately kicked into high gear they worked not just nights and weekends, but every night and every weekend, not for days or weeks, but all year. Excuse me one second. Um, one second, sorry. Not for days, weeks, or months, but for the past year. And today, it is my great honor to share with you what Do It has been doing since the pandemic hit. We transitioned much of the city's workforce to at home rather than in office work. To make this possible, DOIT built out a brand new remote access environment and rolled out WebEx and Teams citywide. We also purchased and distributed tens of thousands of laptops and tablets for city agencies. We purchased and provisioned 500,000 iPads with the Department of Education for New York City public school students who lacked an internet connected device at home to support remote learning. These iPads included unlimited cellular data plans, doubled as hotspots, and came loaded with the apps required for schoolwork. We oversaw the development of the city's contact tracing system, which is the centerpiece of the test and trace course efforts to track and contain the spread of the virus in New York City. We built the systems that support the Get Food program which at its peak delivered 1 million meals a day to New Yorkers in need and recently delivered its 200 millionth meal. We built the PPE donations portal, the AC track system, 
the COVID-19 zone finder, and the DOE mobile student testing application, as well as an entire enforcement system that supports the city's multi-agency COVID-19 inspection efforts. We built both the city clerk's online marriage license platform, allowing New Yorkers to obtain mar online marriage licenses for the first time in our city's history. And unfortunately, a funeral director portal, which connected funeral directors with the deceased when the city's morgues became overrun. We have enabled virtual arraignments and virtually family visits for the incarcerated, as well as online oath and CCRB hearings. And we deployed new contact centers for dozens of agencies. We helped EMS implement telemedicine for low acuity EMS calls to take pressure off of the 911 system. We deployed the tenant resource portal, which connects New Yorkers facing ev eviction with resources to help keep them in their homes. We deployed dozens of new service requests and knowledge articles in the 311 system for COVID related issues, including social distancing and face coverings. And we are managing a massive infrastructure build out in all city homeless shelters that serve families with children to install Wi-Fi in each apartment. Now, as we've discussed previously, in the middle of January, we were called in to overhaul the IT that supports the city's vaccination efforts. That has become my passion and obsession over the past eight weeks. A tremendous amount of progress has been made, but I am also very clear on what's left to be done. And I assure you, I am impatient about getting it done. I understand the old adage that you don't get a second chance to make a good first impression. But if you look at the current state objectively, it is clear that New York City is now leading the way and pushing forward in all the right directions on vaccination technology. Let me walk you through it. The first thing we did was replace the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's vaccine scheduling system. A new one, which can be found at www.myc.gov forward slash vax for NYC, is intuitive and easy to use. We have seen New Yorkers consistently schedule themselves for vaccination appointments in three minutes using this new site. It is also human translated into 10 languages for accessibility. But the system is far more than an online scheduling tool. It manages every aspect of a patient's vaccination from the time they create an initial appointment through to completion of their second dose. That is because the other piece to the system powers all of the operations at the vaccination clinics, including patient check-in, screening, sending of the record, a record of the vaccination to the city's immunization registry, and scheduling of second dose appointments. But we didn't stop there. As I previewed at last month's vaccination oversight hearing, we are now expanding this platform and offering it as a service to all vaccine providers citywide. We are doing this for the sole purpose of streamlining the process for New Yorkers to sign up for vaccinations. The goal is to consolidate the scheduling of as many vaccination locations as possible onto a single online platform to take out the guesswork for New Yorkers. And I'm pleased to say, we've made real progress. Today, we are scheduling for more than 30 different locations on a single platform, including all of the city's mass vaccination sites with the exception of Yankee Stadium, which comes online soon. This includes sites run by DOHMH, FDNY, h, &H Capsule, Northwell, Hospital for Special Surgery, Affiliated Physicians, among others. And we have a pipeline of approximately 40 additional vaccination sites coming online in the coming weeks, run by a number of different providers, including CityBlock, iCrowd, Maimonides, Daybreak, Somos, and all of the FQHCs. We have also made the offer to New York State to put their New York City sites on our platform. Still no word on that, but a girl can dream. Our new platform is also powering a number of temporary vaccination locations with targeted outreach at houses of worship and NYCHA developments. And it also hosts dozens of community-based organizations which schedule residents of the hardest hit communities through reserve, reserved appointments. And with this new platform, we are also able to make thousands of appointments each week through our vaccine call center, 877-VAX4NYC, so that lack of an internet connection does not disadvantage or prevent people from scheduling appointments. Last week alone, the call center made more than 11,000 11, appointments for New Yorkers. 
but that's not enough. We know that there will always be providers who decide not to come onto our platform and continue to schedule through their own siloed scheduling systems. At a minimum, we are asking large providers who make this choice to give us real-time information about appointment availability at their locations. And we have updated our vaccine finder to include that information. To date, we have real-time information on the availability of appointments for 300 sites citywide, including all Walgreens pharmacies, CVS, all the New York State and FEMA sites, DOHMH pods, h and hospitals, and the Gotham clinics. We are expecting Rite Aid pharmacies to come online next week. And yet, despite the pandemic and all the work and the challenges that came with it, the general work of Do It has not stopped for a second over the past year. This past June, we met our commitment to the City Council and New Yorkers, including the deaf and hard of hearing community and survivors of domestic violence, when we launched Text to 911, which has been running smoothly since it went live. As you know, this Text to 911 system is an interim solution designed to bridge the gap between where we are today with an entirely legacy analog 911 system and where we will be in 2024 when we roll out Next Gen 911. The purpose of Next Gen 911 is to allow voice, photos, videos, and text messages to flow seamlessly from the public to 911 on modern digital infrastructure. Make no mistake about it, Next Gen 911 has the potential to be hands down the most impactful new public safety system in the city of New York over the next decade. As a woman who has public safety IT running through her veins, I can tell you it is absolutely imperative that we get it right. So what progress have we made? This year, we registered contracts for three key systems that are fundamental to the development of Next Gen 911. These contracts are with Vesta Solutions to build out the core backend and geographical information systems and NICE systems to build out the new logging and recording system. The city team, which includes members of Do It, NYPD, FDNY, DCAS, and Cyber Command is hard at work with the vendors and all is on track to be fully implemented in 2024. We are also building on the partnership we developed with advocates from the deaf and hard of hearing community during our work on text to 911 to ensure that they have a hand in dreaming up and designing some of the key aspects of the next gen 911 system. Likewise, we made good on our commitment to decommission the NICEWIN network by June 2020. I am pleased to report that DOT, Disney, DEP, NYPD, DCAS, DOHMH, Parks, FISA, and DOB were all completely migrated to commercial carriers, and the NICEWIN network was powered down. We have already begun the work of closing out the North Grumman contract by removing the nice one infrastructure from rooftops and restoring facilities leased for this purpose. Now let me transition into our franchise portfolio. We recently launched a major push in partnership with the telecom carriers to build out 5G equitably across New York City. 5G is the network of the future and it's built out across all five boroughs will be key to the city's recovery efforts. Last week, the mayor announced that the city will be making 7,500 street poles available to the telecom industry for the build out of 5G. This represents the single largest number of poles ever made available for telecom purposes and a doubling of the current number of poles on which 4G technology lives. To get to this point, a bunch of things had to come together. First, we got all of the major carriers to agree on a single unified de design for the shrouds that will house the 5G radios and antennas. This design was reviewed by every community board in the city, as well as the Department of Transportation, and it was approved by the Public Design Commission. As I announced last year, we also registered 12 mobile telecom franchise agreements with companies who will be performing these installations. These franchise agreements contain worker protection clauses, which will be a model for all new franchise agreements going forward. We are also working with our franchisees to ensure that MWBEs benefit from this build out. And we overhauled the system and processes that govern these installations to remove red tape and inefficiency so that 2021 will be the year of 5G in New York City. As you know, 
City Bridge, the franchisee who runs the Link NYC program, owes the city tens of millions of dollars. We were poised to default them days before the pandemic hit. But in light of the public health emergency and the fact that we have been using links for public service messaging throughout, we held off. We have been discussing options for repayment with Brit City Bridge. If not, default remains a card we can and will play. I hope to have an update for the council soon and I will brief you when I do. Now, I believe that one of the keys to ending the digital divide in New York City is bringing down broadband prices by encouraging competition. Right now, the three cable companies hold a virtual monopoly on broadband in New York City. That is because the cable franchise agreements they hold with the city allow them to provide broadband in addition to cable because both run over the same wire. The cable companies have taken unfair advantage of this position. And in particular, this year, they have not done nearly enough to make broadband accessible throughout New York City. At best, their offers to New Yorkers have been insufficient to meet the moment. And at worst, veiled marketing attempts or promotions designed to build a customer base amidst a pandemic. But I'm not telling you anything I haven't told them myself. Unfortunately, federal law preempts the city from regulating franchisees based on consumer pricing. But thanks to the city's city council's recent passage of authorizing resolution 1445A, constraints on our ability to promote, encourage, and frankly, pull in companies to compete in the broadband space against the big cable providers have been lifted. And that's what we are doing to bust this triopoly head on. In accordance with the AR, we will soon be putting out a solicitation inviting companies that seek to provide low cost broadband in New York City to enter into franchise agreements that will allow them to use the city's rights of way to build out their networks. In franchise agreements, it is typical for a franchisee to compensate the city based on linear footage of the franchisee's plant installed. But we're thinking outside the box here. To increase competition in underserved areas of the city, we are considering counting only linear footage in Manhattan below 96th Street for a period of several years when determining compensation requirements. Further, we are considering discounted compensation rates for franchisees with less than the specified number of linear feet of fiber in the city's rights of way to give small providers a leg up. We expect to utilize franchise fees in part for digital literacy and community-based organization grants. Now this year, we also settled longstanding litigation with Verizon arising from the company's failure to meet its commitments under its 2008 cable franchise agreement. Rather than allow the litigation to wind its way through the courts and drag on for years to come, we decided to seize the opportunity to make real progress for New Yorkers afflicted by the digital divide. Under the settlement, Verizon will hold out its files footprint, will build out its files footprint to 500,000 additional households, making high speed broadband available to more New Yorkers. Verizon is compelled to prioritize the least connected community districts and ensure connectivity for every NYCHA residential building. One of the great joys of my job over the past year has been leading the 311 team. To my mind, they are hands down among the unsung heroes of this pandemic who remained on site to serve their fellow New Yorkers in need. Every single day, they showed up and they connected New Yorkers to city services that in many cases saved or changed their lives, be it access to meals, healthcare, testing, remote learning devices, to put the enormity of what the 311 team has done in context for everyone, there are 8.2 million New Yorkers. And in 2020, 311 took over 24 million calls. That's the highest volume in 311's 18 years of operation. That means that in 2020, 311 took three calls for every New Yorker and the average wait time under 33 seconds. But that's not all they did. When I went to visit the 301 call center a few months ago, one of the call center representatives told me something that moved me. She said that throughout the pandemic, some New Yorkers called 311 not because they were looking for information or a city service, but because they were lonely, isolated from the world, and wanted to hear a human's voice on the other end. The compassion, warmth, professionalism, 
and the dedication the 311 team has shown over the past year is awe-inspiring. And their work was supported by massive improvements in the 311 system over the past year, many of them responsive to feedback from the city council, including enabling photo and video attachments for more types of service requests, adding additional service request types available via the mobile app, and emailing alerts for all service requests, regardless of whether the customer has signed up for an, an account. Coming soon are improved location selection and accuracy, which is planned to start in April, and customer satisfaction surveys in 10 languages in accordance with recently passed intro 1525, which will be rolled out in April. In the interest of time, I will now take the committees through our FY22 budget as it stands today. DOIT's fiscal 2022 preliminary budget provides for operating expenses of approximately $699.2 million, allocating $171.2 million in personnel services to support 1,824 full-time positions and $528 million for other than personnel services or OTPS. Intracity funds transferred from other agencies account for $139.5 million or about 20% of our total budget allocation. Telecommunications costs represent the largest portion of the intracity expense projected at 100.5 million for fiscal 2021. For fiscal year 2021, the expense budget appropriation increased by 74.4 million from the fiscal year 2022 November financial plan to the preliminary financial plan. The increase to the fiscal year 2021 preliminary budget is largely attributed to the funding that DOIT has received for COVID related costs funding for expense costs associated with approved capital projects and intracity funding transfers from agencies that had been reflected in the January financial plan. For fiscal year 2022, the expense budget appropriation increased by 10.9 million from the fiscal year 2022 November financial plan to the preliminary financial plan. The increase to the fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget is largely attributed to the funding that DOIT has received for expense costs associated with approved capital projects. With that, I want to thank the committees for this opportunity to update you on DOIT's important work, and I am now happy to take your questions. Thank you. Okay. I, I don't know. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> well, I will now turn over to you, Chair Holden, for questions. And I just want to say, panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. That was a um, uh, great testimony. We were uh, very thorough and um, it's, it's really sad to hear about the 311 operators, just uh, people wanting to just talk to, to, um, to, to a human voice. That's quite moving. And um, as was your much of your testimony. And I know the challenges that you must have had in your agency certainly um, rose to the occasion. And I want to thank you for that and your commitment. Um, uh, by the way, we've just been joined by council members Constantinides and Ballone. Uh, so, um, just talking about the um, the franchisees, the competition uh, in in you uh, that you mentioned, and um, certainly um, it would it's, it hope we hope that it will benefit uh, customers, broadband customers in New York City. Uh, could, do you do you have any idea of what um, in comparison what New York City customers pay for broadband versus other cities, and what? Uh, how much it would, I guess, of how much it would come down the price of, of broadband in the future? So, um, I don't have the comparison to other cities, um, but what I can say is there is a wide range of costs depending on what type of broadband plan you have and also depending on how much competition there is in your neighborhood so the whole idea is to bring on additional competitors in the market in particular in areas or parts of the city where there is only one provider and no competition to bring down 
the costs of all of the plans, not just the lowest cost plan. Um, but I, I apologize that I can't give you more specificity just because there is such a such a big range. Yeah, we, we all know that we pay the most in New York City for everything almost, right? We know that uh, compared to other cities, if you travel around the country, uh, we pay a lot for all, all services, uh, you know, but it, it would be our, our cable bills and, you know, broadband keeps going, it keeps going up. Everything's going up every year. We see an increase. Uh, we never see a decrease. So it would be great. It would be refreshing to, to feel that, yes, if with the more competition and finally we're going to get that, that we can realize a 50% savings or 25% savings because we're, New Yorkers get hit over the head all the time with costs of everything from just transportation to, to, to everything, you know, electricity, heat and everything, we're, you know, taxes. So it'd be nice to see that the city's actually working for us um, on competition to bring our broadband costs down. So I, I thank you for that. But um, I just wanna get into a couple of questions and you mentioned some of this uh, in your testimony, but do its budget includes tens of millions in funding related to do its response to the pandemic, as you mentioned, most of which to expand remote access for municipal employees and resources to securing the 311 call center and nyc.gov. But the plan, you know, the plan uh, going forward does not assume COVID related spending in fiscal year 2022. Do you think working remotely will become a common practice in the way municipal employees will conduct business? And if so, how is your department planning for this change? So um, I don't know if it's going to become a common practice that's sort of above my pay grade. But what I can tell you is that um, last March, we built out all of the infrastructure to support it. So we can support, you know, 100,000 plus city workers working remotely. So that investment has been made. And I'm very pleased to say that that remote access capability has been working like fairly stably uh, for the past year. And um, it's one of the reasons that the city was able to so seamlessly continue to offer so many of the services um, that the city offers um, despite the transition to uh, home or, or remote work. So, so you re we really don't know as a city whether many of our employees will We'll have the option to work remotely yet we because we're not we're still in the pandemic obviously i'm telling you i i don't have that in the answer to that question yeah no i, I understand that no I'm, I'm just getting to the next part which is um has has the pandemic led to any long-term changes in do its budget planning because that's that's the key like we have to plan for obviously if we do are still we if we still are in a pandemic um going forward um, so a few things to point out here. First, the long list of the COVID related projects that I, I um, gave you in my testimony, those were funded by federal grants from FEMA, from the CDC, from different federal programs. Um, so those costs, uh, and we made sure that, you know, if we were spending money on something COVID related, that those contracts had the provisions necessary to be FEMA reimbursable. So that was an important piece of making sure everything we did was, was reimbursable and would not be charged to the city. Um, in terms of what you know, the experience of the past year means going forward and for our budget at Do It. What I would say is a lot of the things that we talked about last year um, and that the council funded last year, in particular around this notion of modernization, both for the city's IT infrastructure generally and for next gen 911, you know, that was 
funded last year. Those are multi-year programs. Um, that's those are things that we have already started building out very aggressively. And those are for sure the right investments to make heading into a world 2022, 2021 and beyond where so many things have moved online and that's not going to change. Right. Um, so I do think that the modernization efforts that you had the foresight to fund last year are going to be proved to be very wise investments, you know, for the for the new world ahead. Okay, I just I want to talk about the 311 system and securing the 311 system. So the, the uh, preliminary plan includes 10 million in fiscal 2021 for additional contract costs related to 311 yes. uh, and nyc.gov operations to deal with the additional demand due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Can you talk about how the pandemic has affected 311? Like um, how many permanent staff has the 311 system added during the pandemic um, and things like that? Like what, what additions you, you needed to make to address the pandemic a little bit more in detail? Sure. Um, so I took over 311 operations uh, last April. And at the time, 311 just got a huge onslaught, onslaught of COVID related calls. And, and we didn't know how long that volume was going to last. Turns out it lasted <laughs> quite some time. It's still very high. And as I said in my testimony, like the 311 system last year got like 24.6 million calls. If you compare that to, you know, the, the previous year, 2019, it was 19 million calls. So like 5 million more calls, almost 6 million more calls this year than last year. All of that driven by COVID. Two and a half million calls for get food, the get food program, people calling 311 to request meals. So in order to deal with that onslaught of calls immediately, we had to bring in temporary staff to increase the number of call takers that we had. So initially we brought in the NYPD cadets who were working from home at the time and they were an available resource and they did a wonderful job. They came to through and one and they worked with us. Um, and we also worked with an MWBE to bring on additional staffing beyond uh, the 311 cadets, just because the volume was, was so large. And also keep in mind, we, it was really important to us to treat people calling 311 with respect. It was an incredibly difficult time for New Yorkers. And I didn't want them, none of us wanted them hanging on the phone five minutes, 10 minutes, waiting for someone to pick up. So that 33 second you know, wait time is something that we are really proud of. And it's something that we measure every single day. What was the average wait time uh, yesterday? Um, so, Anyway, we ended up losing the NYPD cadets when they had to go back to their jobs. So we brought on more additional temporary staffing to deal in particular with the COVID calls. I wanna be really clear that the surge staffing, those call takers cannot do the full range of what a 311 customer uh, call center representative can do. Um, they handle really COVID related calls and it actually ended up being incredibly useful um, during a few weather events uh, this year because we were also able to plan in advance and have those surge uh, call takers handling those weather related calls. Yeah, and just, uh, I just wanna talk about when the vaccine rollout came in, I guess that was December, uh, mid-December, um, and people were, couldn't maneuver through vaccine finder and they couldn't uh, get an appointment. Did that burden get on to 311? Uh, it, it was kind of probably, I would imagine, overwhelming at that point where you had to even hire more people. So, blessedly, 
No. And it was actually something that I was really concerned about and planned for. And I will explain, I'll explain why. So for vaccinations, I was very clear in my own head that if you added the onslaught of vaccine calls to 311, that that was going to slow down the response time or increase the wait time for all 311, you know, general 311 calls. So what we decided to do was set up a completely separate number for vaccinations, which is 877-VAX for NYC. And we made a real point of publicizing that number and making that number easy to remember so that the, the service that we provide at 311 wouldn't get killed by the onslaught of vaccine related calls. Now, that's not to say that 311 didn't take vaccine related calls. If you call 311, the first thing you'll get is for vaccine information, press one. And that will transfer you to 877-VAX for NYC. Um, so we, we tried to make sure that people calling through in one, if they were confused and calling through in one for vaccination, like information and schedule appointments, they could still easily get there without really knowing they were leaving through in one, but that we also took some of the load off of the through in one system and sent it direct to this VAX for NYC call center that was set up just for this purpose. So, so you're confident that the 311 system is now stable and uh, you, you're, you're past the, the, the really difficult times. Uh, oh, yes. you, you were overrun at one point. Um, uh, the, so I look at the 311 wait times twice a day, every day in the morning and in the evening and we manage um, our routing and everything with a real focus on keeping those wait times and I should say the abandonment rates low. What I don't like to see is an abandonment rate over 4% where people are hanging up before they get, they get to an agent. And so, yes, this is something that we and the 311 team manage very closely. Okay, um, but I just want to make, uh, we've been joined by council member Eric Ulrich. Um, and let, let me talk about um, the citywide IT efficiency savings. Uh, the city spends hundreds of millions of dollars on technology services, and I'm sure your department has been looking at ways in which the city can save money through citywide IT savings initiatives. Can you talk in general about ways the city can reduce costs through improved IT efficiencies? Um, sure. Um, and I think in, in the, in the list of COVID related projects that I set out for you at the beginning of my testimony, you know, one thing I, I didn't say, but I hope is clear is that do it has really become an agency that other agencies go to when they have a really big tech program that they need to roll out. And I think that that's really key to efficiency uh, in terms of like managing the city's spend on IT. Because what we're able to do is reuse things that we've already built for different agencies for different purposes. So having do it as this center of excellence that other agencies call on when they have a problem. There happen to be a lot of big challenges that agencies or services agencies needed to provide quickly over the past year that required tech solutions. Having them call uh, a centralized uh, place allowed us to reuse investments we've already made. We're also able to better leverage our buying power doing that. So for example, uh, when we rolled out laptop citywide in March, instead of every agency calling the different laptop companies to see if they could procure devices and getting markups, we arranged for a big deal for tens of thousands of 
laptops at discounted costs based on bulk. It's one thing that's really important is for the city to be able to leverage its buying power. And we have so much scale that we really can. I mean, we're much bigger than any other city in terms of uh, what we what we buy. We're more like a federal agency. Um, and in the past year, being able to do that, I believe has saved the city and the feds who have paid for a, a bunch of this, a lot of, a lot of money. And it's something we should continue to do going forward. Um, I'll just have a few more questions and I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleagues uh, and, and co-chair. Um, let's talk can, hiring and attrition management. Uh, in fiscal 2021, do it will generate budgetary savings of 1.9 million uh, in fiscal uh, 2021 through the city's hiring and attrition management program, which allows for one replacement for every three employees lost to attrition. And it is anticipated to reduce headcount by 83 positions across the department. How would this reduction in headcount impact operations in, at Do It? So this is something that every agency is working through. Um, and what I can say is um, we are making sure that we staff the most critical programs responsibly. So for example, public safety 911. Um, I do not anticipate that as a result of these reductions, that next gen 911 or the 911 system will lose, you know, its its staffing. Um, so, two parts really, uh, mostly trying to find efficiencies in terms of what people are spending their time on and prioritization. Okay, um, just one more uh, or two more questions, and I'll I'll, I'll come back to. Some of my other questions, but uh, can can you just uh, talk about the Do It Enterprise Online Services capital funding? The Do It's capital budget includes 143 million for the purchase of software licenses as part of the Enterprise Online Services project. What is the Enterprise Online Service project, and what will it achieve? I think that you're talk if you're talking about the capital funding um, put in place for mo the modernization efforts. Yeah. Um, that is really an investment in the city's IT future and making sure that we are modernizing everything from our network to our servers to um, our storage. Um, the other piece to it is um, our enterprise license agreements where we buy uh, license agreements for things like Microsoft Word, Teams um, for all city agencies. And we recently uh, negotiated a new enterprise license agreements that again, allow us to leverage the city's buying power instead of having every agency and every office negotiating their own. Okay. All right, um, I'll turn it over to committee council. If, uh, council members have any questions? Uh, my co-chair might have some questions. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah, co-chair Salamanca, please ask your questions. Irene, thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner, uh, it's great uh, seeing you. And, and, um, I, I see my uh, my colleague uh, Chair Holden. He he really uh, honed in on three one one. I had some questions on that, so I will won't be repetitive. Um, during this pandemic, uh, or we saw you know um, we had um, remote learning and blended learning, um, and communities such as mine um, and, and communities low income communities throughout the city saw. Uh, the digital divide between wealthier communities and communities uh, of color that are, are predominantly mm -hmm. local communities. Um, in my council district alone, I have over 50 homeless shelters. Um, you know, I have I'm one of the council members that has that's housing the most homeless uh, uh, shelters. 
And as a result of that, I have certain schools where 60%, I have a school where 60% of the student population lives in transitional housing. And one of the challenges that we saw was that homeless shelters uh, do not have internet access or Wi-Fi uh, in their buildings. And so the preliminary plan includes a $13.9 million in fiscal 2021 um, and baseline funding of 2.6 mil beginning in fiscal 2022 to upgrade internet connections at homeless shelters. So my, my question to you, Commissioner, is how many shelters would this initiative cover? Um, and, and, sorry. and what's the cost to cover all homeless shelters in the city of New York? Okay. So this initiative covers the approximately 240 shelters citywide that serve families with children. Uh, as you know, the, the majority of those shelters are run by the Department of Homeless Services, um, but there are an additional 40 that are run by HRA or overseen by HRA. So it covers all of them. And I wanna be really clear about what this is. This puts a dedicated internet connection in every apartment, in every shelter that serves families with children. So we are not rolling out a shared Wi-Fi service where kids have to compete for bandwidth with someone else watching a movie. This is a proper internet connection as I have in my home in each apartment, in each of these shelters that serve families with children. There are over 10,000 such apartments and each one is getting its own internet connection. Now, these, that, that project is very large because a lot of these uh, buildings did not have the necessary infrastructure in place to support running the cables and the wires into each apartment. So it's not like I could just show up and throw a modem in each apartment. Each one was its own and remains its own sort of large construction project so we pay a monthly cost for each apartment, for the service in each apartment, but a lot of the year one funding, $13 million of it, is for the construction build out of the infrastructure in those shelters to support dedicated Wi-Fi in each apartment. And I'm very pleased to tell you, we have made a lot of progress we have completed Wi-Fi in 95 facilities in each of the apartments in 95 facilities. We have another 40 or 50 um, shelters that are going to be coming online with Wi-Fi in the coming four or five weeks. So a lot is underway. And this was an initiative that was started in September. So we've, we've really been very much focused on it. Um, I also want to say, you know, just in response to the, to the question, as, as you heard me say in my, my testimony, um, back in, in March, as soon as we saw that schools were about to go remote, we were on the phone, I was on the phone, with the CEOs of the telecom companies, all the companies that produce tablets and laptops, trying to secure devices with an internet connection for New York City school students who lacked an internet connection. At the time, we estimated that it was approximately 300,000. I called Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, Apple, Google, Dell, everyone. And if you remember at the time, the world was shut down, right? Supply chains were shut down. China, where all the factories are, was shut down. We got Apple to prioritize New York City school students and ship us 300,000 iPads to New York City where we received them all, provisioned them, loaded them up with the apps to support remote learning. And importantly, 
included in each one was an unlimited data plan so that even students who didn't have internet connections would have a device that they could connect to the internet to support remote learning. This school year, we added an additional 200,000 based on requests that DOE got from other students. Um, what is the timeline for completion for, for these uh, 240 family shelters? And, and I'm, I'm curious, these 240 family shelters, do you have a, you may have, I, do you have a number, like a breakdown of how many are in the Bronx, in, in, how many are in every borough? I do. I have a breakdown of every single shelter. I do not have that with me today, but I can get that to you very easily um, right after this. Um, what was the first the timeline question? for completion? Oh, the timeline for completion. The timeline for completion. Sure. So everything is going to be done by this summer. I know that that sounds, that may sound tone deaf because the school year will be over by the summer. We wanted to start this last March. I was asked to build out Wi-Fi in shelters last March. We couldn't. We asked every company if they could do it, but everyone was shut down. The whole city was shut down. Everything was in lockdown. We couldn't send these companies to do these construction projects in people's apartments, which is why it started a few months later when we responsibly could do it. Um, but again, I knew, I, I was impatient to get Wi-Fi rolled out in the shelters, but I also was somewhat comforted knowing that back in April, we had given every student, starting with the students in homeless shelters, an internet connected device. And just to address a question head on that I know I'm going to get, um, we heard reports starting in September that certain students were having problems with their internet connection on their iPads. As soon as we heard those reports, we offered every student in all shelters um, the ability to let us know that they were having a problem with their internet connection. And within 24 hours, we swapped out any of those iPads from T-Mobile service to Verizon service. Furthermore, in our construction timeline for the Wi-Fi, we prioritized the shelters where we were getting more reports of the problems with the T-Mobile service. Okay. All right. So the, the timeline for completion, any- uh, oh, By the summer. By the summer, okay, all right. Um, I, um, when we were going over the preliminary budget and we were going over your request, something that I found extremely interesting, and, um, and, and I know that this may predate you, but I just, I just need to ask. Okay. The Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment falls under Do It. Yes. It makes no sense to me why it falls under Do It, and, um, I have, so, you know, I, I have two movie studios in my council district. And so, you know, the challenges that I have with them is that there are these big studios. One of them has a huge parking lot, yet they want to take parking spaces from the community so that they can bring in their trailers so that they can have, you know, the, their productions. Um, but it's my understanding that the mayor's office of media and entertainment has his own director, correct? Or like his own commissioner. Um, so can you explain to me why is the mayor's office of media and entertainment under do it? Does, does it make sense? So I can explain to you why it's under do it. Um, it's the mayor's office of media entertainment, the civic engagement commission, cyber command. Um, there are a bunch of smaller offices that fall under do it. And the reason why um, is largely to do, again, with, with government efficiency. So as a larger agency, we provide all of the administrative functions for these smaller offices so that you don't need to have in each of the smaller offices, for example, a human resources office or a, a legal team. Um, so for those, I, I call them child agencies, the nonprofit <laughs> do it provides for their budget, their legal services, their 
HR services and the like. I think that's a that's that's a, that's a waste for your agency to oversee. I think you know there it's it's not a common. I think that division should be under the mayor's office. Not it should be under do it. But I'll move on. I just needed to ask uh, uh, that. Um, last year's hearing, uh, we spoke about City Bridge, the operator for the Link NYC kiosk, and on March third of twenty twenty. Um, uh, during last year's preliminary budget hearing, you stated, as the new commissioner of deal of do it, I am poised to take any <laughs> and all necessary actions against multiple breaches of contract to collect the money that the city is owed. And so the fiscal year 2022 revenue budget anticipates zero revenue from Link NYC kiosk. Uh, so can you just explain what actions have you taken since March of 2020 to recoup that money owed yeah. by City Bridge? And approximately how much do they owe the city now? So absolutely, and thank you for that for that question. Um, we, were, as I said in my testimony, I was we were poised to default City Bridge when I testified in front of uh, the council last year, um, and a few days later, as we were getting ready to do it, the pandemic hit. Um, and we decided that given everything that was going on in the city, the fact that um, we were using the link kiosks for uh, public service messaging, that it was bad timing to uh, default city bridge um, and um, that we would wait to do it until things calm down. Now, in the interim, we have been working very closely with City Bridge on options for repayment. And if those options don't come through soon, the same thing I said at last year's hearing, default absolutely remains on the table as something that we will pursue because we will be paid back. So how much do they, how much does uh, City Bridge currently owe the city of New York as of today? I think it's something like $90 million. I can get you the exact number. Wow, okay, all right, it's a lot of money, okay. All right. Uh, and then finally, uh, my last questions. I was really excited when um, I last spoke with you. Uh, uh, we, we, we worked together on the cable franchise markets. Um, basically, you know, these three companies had a monopoly over cable, cable throughout the city of New York. Um, and basically, we took actions that came out of the land use committee and I believe the council passed uh, to give your, your agency the approval to open up um, these uh, franchise agreements to other companies. Um, uh, so can you just explain the status? Where are we with that? How many have applied? When, when is the city of New York gonna have options other than those three providers that are providing cable, cable services? Thank you for that question. Um, so the solicitation uh, that to, to invite new franchisees to come in and get broadband or information service franchise agreements pursuant to the author, authorization authorizing resolution that you passed um, should be going out imminently. We have city planning approval on it now and the law department approval. So it will be out this month. And so when do you anticipate that uh, we, the, the, your, your agency, the city of New York will approve these providers and New, New Yorkers would have other options. What timeline do you, do you think? Um, so we have to go through the whole process, right? Where the franchisees submit their bids. So this is not something, I don't wanna leave you with the expectation that this is something that New Yorkers are gonna see next month, a dozen new uh, internet service providers, um, but it is definitely something that uh, will fully take shape uh, over the next year. Okay, 
All right. Well, Commissioner, thank you very much. Uh, Chair Holden, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. Um, I, uh, committee Council, do we have any other council members? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Chair Salamanca and Chair, Chair Holden. I will now turn to Co-Chair Co -Chair Moy, I apologize, for questions. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Salamanca. Thank you, Chair Holden. Uh, Commissioner, uh, good to see you. I just have uh, two, two very quick questions here. Um, one, uh, what is Do It doing uh, to ensure that there is no lost revenue to the city and the CAOs as the cable, as the cable companies switch over to, to broadband? So um, the, the cable franchises that like Verizon, Charter, and Altice mm -hmm. hold with New York City um, allow them to provide both cable and because broadband is run over the same wire, also broadband to New Yorkers. Revenue from the cable franchises, franchise agreements has gone down over the past few years and will continue to go down over the next several as cord cutting continues. Um, but the introduction of broadband doesn't um, impact our ability to collect revenue as part of the cable franchise agreements. So when they switch over to broadband, the same cable companies, we're not gonna see any revenue from that switch over? No, they pay us for the wire. Okay. And I think you mentioned this earlier in your testimony. I'm not, I'm not uh, sure I, I might've, um, missed it, but can the city charge a reasonable fee to the cable companies uh, for use and occupation of the public uh, rights of way in connection with their delivery of uh, broadband services? Yeah. So the city is fairly compensated for such use and is such use currently free? No, the, the, um, the franchisees pay mm -hmm. us uh, franchise fees associated with their use of the city's rights of way. So generally, like you heard me speaking about this in my testimony, generally the model we use to charge franchisees is based on how many linear feet of cable they've run through uh, the city streets. Um, what we're thinking about so that exists today. That's part of the franchise model. That's how we collect the, the franchise revenues. What we are considering to encourage more companies to come into the broadband market in New York City is for this new type of franchise agreement that you've authorized us to enter into for broadband, the information services franchise agreements. Changing that, that franchise fee model to look at things like only charging these companies for the number of linear feet that they run through like Manhattan south of 96th Street and not charging them for the linear feet that they run, you know, in some of the hardest hit communities where the digital divide is most problematic. So we're looking at that model now for the information services franchise agreement, but that won't change for the cable companies. You got it, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Chairs, for the opportunity to ask a few questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Moya. And I now turn back to Chair Holden for additional thank, questions. Thank you, Chair Moya. And uh, uh, I just have a, a few more questions, Commissioner. Um, uh, last year, New York City residents and visitors finally got the text option to 911, which is essential to our hard of hearing community and victims of domestic violence. And I wanna congratulate you for, on this achievement. Um, as you mentioned at our last budget hearing, the purpose of NextGen 911 is to allow voice photos and, and text messages to flow uh, from the public to 911 digital infrastructure. Does the system or will the system have the capabilities of receiving and responding to images or photos sent via text messages? Yes. All right. And, and um, does it work on every cell phone provider like Verizon, T-Mobile, AT&T? It will. 
So right now, I think what you're referring to is right now in, in our interim text to 911 solution, um, the only carrier that supports picture messages is weirdly Sprint. Um, and the other major carriers don't support picture messaging to non next gen 911 systems. So when we get to next gen 911, all of, all the carriers will support uh, picture messaging to 911. And what we're doing now is we are working with some of our advocate partners um, and and the telecom industry to see if we can't get them to support picture messaging now before we get to next gen 911. So the city is expected to complete the transition to next gen 911 system by 2024, am I correct? Yes. Okay, according to the next gen report that the administration released a few months ago, the program is now in the design phase. Yep. Can you give us a, like a status update on this project? And do you anticipate that this project will be on time? I do anticipate that this project will be on time. Um, and the status update is this year, we registered three contracts or basically all of the contracts that support the next gen 911 system that are broken out into three classes. So class one is the, the IP network and the, the core services. Class two is the logging and recording system. And class three are the GIS, the geospatial systems. So all of those contracts are registered. All of those vendors are on board. The city through NYPD, do it, FDNY, Cyber Command are all working with the vendors to come up with a detailed technical design by the end of May. I think that it's May 28th. And then after the design phase, we move into the implementation phase. But for me, what's going on right now, the design phase is the most important part of getting this right. Because if you don't design it well, then whatever you build doesn't work. So you, the, the budget is sufficient for the project to be completed, right? You said? The budget's a quarter of a billion dollars, yes. It's sufficient. Um, has the pandemic impacted the progress of, of the project at all? No. That's nice to and hear. And the reason okay. it hasn't is because we have, as I, as I told you, a dedicated public safety team that um, is run by a new position that I created, which is Deputy Commissioner of Public Safety. And so that Deputy Commissioner of Public Safety has, you know, we've shielded that team, not from all of the COVID efforts, but from many of them, so that we could keep the next gen 911 system on pace. Okay, I just want to say we've been joined by Council Member Rosenthal. And uh, I just have a couple of questions and I'll turn it over to uh, my colleague, Council Member Barron. Um, nice win, decommission and transition. Uh, do its uh, budget in includes over 30 million in fiscal 2021 and 40 million in fiscal 2022 for a nice win system, which was decommissioned last year. These amounts roughly match the annual costs of maintenance for the system when nice win was fully operational. Now I understand that there is a cost related to the breakdown of the system and trend, you know, transition costs associated with moving agencies off the system. However, do you anticipate that the costs related to the nice win decommission and transition will total over 70 million for this year and, and next, or can we expect a reduction in this budget? So last June, we met our commitment to the council to shut power down the nice win network, which took away like a nice chunk of costs off of our book. And those were the costs associated with licensing the bandwidth that the nice win network used. Right now, the other chunk of cost is associated with the leases for the equipment that's on buildings citywide that supported the NICEWIN network. So 
um, according to those leases, we need to either remove the equipment or buy out the lease uh, or, or buy out our leases. And that's what's going on right now. We are removing equipment and uh, buying out the leases where we can to get all of those costs off of our books. Because last year you testified that DOT, uh, sanitation, DEP should be fully migrated by the committed deadline of June 2020. Yeah. However, no, they were all, they were all, all of the agencies, like there were like 10 or 12 agencies, they were all fully migrated by June of 2020. Uh, and so on, you know, commercial carriers on other networks, the nice one network was powered down. And now we are doing construction projects throughout the city to remove the nice wind equipment from rooftops so that we get out of the leases as quickly as possible. But DOT is not, is, did they transition? I'm yeah, sorry. everyone's off of nice wind. Everybody, Nicewin. everybody off. Down. It's okay. Nice wind is no longer. All right. Okay, that's good to hear. All right, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Um, <laughs> back to committee, back to the uh, com uh, committee council. Oh, thank you, Chair Holden. And I see that Council Member Barron has a question. Yes, thank you so much. I've Very learned talk. more about technology in a year than what I've known through my lifetime and still have so much more to understand. And I think that uh, Chair Holden just asked a question. I was in and out with some other business. Were you talking about those structures that were on rooftops? Is that what you were talking about? Are those yeah. a part of the system? How do they function? I was, um, Chair Holden asked me a question about the NYSWIN network, which was a dedicated uh, network for New York City agencies um, that we decommissioned in June. So no, none of the agencies use it anymore. We've transitioned them all off of it. It was really legacy technology. And so now we're removing those structures on the building so that we can get out of the lease payments associated with them. And does that mean all of those structures? Were you responsible for all of those structures or are there some that are privately managed? No, the, the, um, the city puts up, uh, the, the city is responsible for all of the equipment that supported the nice one network. Now there's, lots of other equipment on buildings okay. citywide that has nothing to do with nice one that we are not responsible for okay. but the nice one equipment i am responsible for okay. and i hope for it to be gone soon thank you are there any health implications uh of any kind of emissions from that type of equipment that should concern our residents has there been have there been studies done to yeah. get an assessment of that it, Thank you um, for that question. I think there what you are likely referring to is 5G. Uh, and 5G is really, um, it's, it's the network of the future, which we are building out. And in, in many instances, you know, as we're moving agencies off of the NYSWIN network, they're going on to 4G and soon to be 5G solutions as we roll 5G out citywide. Uh, in terms of the, the health concerns that you hear uh, people discussing related to 5G, 5G uh, and their emissions are regulated by the feds. And we do not have the ability or the authority. We are preempted by the feds in terms of regulating 5G technology and emissions. What we do do is we check to make sure that all installations of 5G infrastructure in New York City, that they comply with the radio frequency emission standards set by the FCC. So we are not allowed to slow down, stop, prevent the rollout of 5G based on health and safety concerns, but we are allowed to check and make sure that it's 
that the installations are in line with federal standards. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was pleased to hear of the attention that you're giving, giving to uh, family shelters, shelters that have families in them, it's very important. Disappointed that it's taking so long, but understanding now that you have to actually go in and build out the infrastructure. So uh, that is somewhat of a understanding, but still very concerning that it's, it will in fact be more than a year that some students will not have been able to have relied on a steady connection. But my other question is, what are you doing? It may have been asked, I don't know. What are you doing in NYCHA developments to expand what the services that they have to connect to the internet? Um, so a few things. If we wanna start first with the, the iPads that came with their own you know, intercellular data plans, the um, first iPads that we had ready back in early April <laughs> They went to students in NYCHA uh, housing and they went to students in shelters. So they were the first to get the iPads back in April as they became available. And as I said, those all came with their own internet connection, which also doubled as a hotspot, which was something that we realized we could do later, which was great. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of similar efforts to build out broadband in NYCHA, I want to connect you to my colleague, John Paul Farmer, who runs the mayor's office of the chief technology office, who is leading um, the city's efforts to expand broadband in NYCHA in much the same way I am leading those efforts in, uh, for Wi-Fi in the homeless shelters. Okay. Slightly okay. different approach because the scale is larger, mm -hmm. but he can give you a full briefing on it. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity. Oh, one other question. What sure. is the connection? I heard you talk about intra-city intra transfers. How is CUNY uh, involved in helping to supply a workforce or connections with that? Is there a relationship that you have with CUNY uh, that will be able to look for perhaps jobs being affordable, being offered to students as they complete their training. So uh, and is your head count, is your head count, what are the titles within your head count as, compo as opposed to what gets contracted out? Okay, two different questions related. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start with CUNY. Some of the most talented, energetic go-getter um, employees we have at Do It came from CUNY and were, I, I'm gonna get the word wrong, but CUNY fellows assigned to right. Do It and they are fabulous. And I every time we have an opportunity to work with CUNY to bring in CUNY staff, it's wonderful for the agency and I hope a very good learning opportunity for those those students. It's some real world uh, tech experience. Now, in, in terms of your question about what is done in house versus what is contracted out. Yes. I appreciate this. I appreciate this question because sometimes people see see dollar figures and they say, well, what do you why don't you do this yourself? When we have big programs, like, for example, Next Generation 911. That is going to be, you know, a few years. Next Gen 911 is a longer one, but sometimes you have these tech projects that it's going to take like six months to develop it. And then once it's developed, it's done, you know, you move on to the next thing and the system's up and you operate it. It doesn't make sense in all of those cases for the city to expand its headcount to deal with those programs because the build phase of those programs doesn't last forever. It usually lasts a few months. In the case of something like Next Gen 911, which really could go either way, it, you know, it lasts a few years. Um, so we contract out work that is not 
in two cases. One, work that is not going to be permanent, where it doesn't make sense to bring people on like full time forever into city jobs to do because the work will be done in a matter of months or a year. And then we also kind of contract out another type of work where we need like very specific types of expertise that we don't have in house. Those are the two real circumstances under which city IT work is contracted out. Thank you. Thank you so much. You've been very pointed in answering my questions and I appreciate that. And to the chairs, thank you for the extended time to ask my questions. Thank you so much, Councilmember Barron, for your questions. And I, at this point, I do not see any additional questions from council members, and I want to turn it back to the chair, Holden. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you, Commissioner. I just want to uh, just uh, say how great the testimony was today and the questions and um, I, I appreciate all the hard work you put in uh, to do it, and, uh, and and thank you for a very informative uh, hearing. And uh, there's no more questions. Uh, for I, I I thought Councilman Rosenthal had a question before, but I guess uh, she she does she lowered the hand. Thank you so much, Commissioner, and your staff for for um, for coming to the hearing today and providing excellent testimony. And thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Holden. Okay. Okay, we will now turn to public testimony. Once your name is called to testify, our staff will unmute you and the surgeon at arm will set the timer to announce that you might begin. We ask each panelist to limit his or her testimony to three minutes. Council members will have an opportunity to ask questions after each testimony. I would like now Welcome, Mr. Noel Heldalgo from Beta NYC to testify. Starting time. Hello, uh, my name is Noel Hidalgo. We are a civic organization dedicated to improving all lives in New York through civic design, technology, and data. Um, several years ago, we wrote this document called the People's Roadmap uh, for New York City, and it's oriented around four digital freedoms, the freedom to connect, the freedom to learn, the freedom to innovate, and the freedom to collaborate. My testimony will follow along these lines. In regards to the freedom to connect, um, the past year has been a testament to high-speed bi-directional internet. Our city must require a robust digital backbone, or our city requires a robust digital backbone that is ready for the 21st century. Beta NYC uh, agrees that we must invest in this opportunity per the internet master plan, and we should build out a public network for the 21st century and beyond. As part of the city's technology budget, uh, we hope that the council will investigate and put in items so that way the city can fund a public option for an internet master plan. In regards to learn, um, uh, we are currently hosting NYC's Open Data Week with the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics. On Monday, we launched a new Intro to Open Data course, and, to, uh, and as of today, we have trained over 200 people in the last 7, uh, 72 hours in regards to open data. On Thursday, we'll be launching our very first Intro to Open Data in Spanish, which is a course exclusively delivered in Spanish. In the last three years, we have received council funding that has supported our digital inclusion and literacy programming. And in the last three years, we've engaged over 2000 uh, New Yorkers and 1400 of them have attended open data classes. Um, we ask that the city council continue to fund its digital literacy and inclusion initiative grants so that way we can continue to provide for the needs of your colleagues and constituents. Uh, second, we ask that council develop a funding framework to help nonprofit organizations like Beta NYC provide literacy and career development for all New Yorkers. Lastly, we also ask that CUNY Service Corps, which is one of our dear partners in our uh, um, a civic Innovation Fellows Program is funded to ensure career opportunities exist for the next generation of public interest technology, technologists, designers, and uh, analysts. Um, we also just want to very briefly end on innovation and collaboration. 
Sadly, uh, community boards are still demonstrating that they have significant challenges getting across the digital divide. Uh, not only do they need to continue technology literacy training, they need that more than one do it tech support person to address their hardware, software, and training needs. Um, lastly, we would also like this particular council to start exploring what needs to be done to reorganize the city's technology leadership. Um, we smart. are, thank you, uh, just one, 30 more seconds, please. Um, uh, this reorganization must start with reorganizing Do It and the CTO complete a complete inventory of the city's computing systems. We really need the city's IT infrastructure to work for the 21st century, uh, and we need this particular council to start doing so. I will submit the rest of my testimony in written format. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hildalgo. And I will turn to Chair Holden if he has any questions or remarks. Well, no, it's nice to see you again. And um, thank you for all that you do uh, in the tech world. Um, I just want to um, reinforce uh, one thing you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned a, a number of things that are very, very important. But with the um, Tech Help for Community Boards, which we see, um, Time and time again, I cover four community boards and um, they all say the same thing. They need tech help and they don't get it. Um, but your, your organization is certainly helping along with CUNY, but um, it should be established as a regular budgetary item, like you mentioned, where the community boards do have tech support, uh, automatic tech support, not just rely on, on obviously um, a, a few CUNY students or your organization. It should be built into the budget uh, because just in this year, uh, Queens County went to an online um, application system for community board members. And some people got dropped by the wayside who couldn't apply online, didn't know how to do it, couldn't maneuver. And as a result did not get, may not get reappointed because they're, op they're obviously their application did not go in, but there's so much more uh, to providing uh, tech support and with community boards and communicating with the public uh, and helping uh, just in, in general support that you had mentioned. So I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. We'll work in the city council to try to make this happen. But I, I and again, I congratulate you for all your work, um, obviously in, in, um, in spreading the, uh, the, the wealth on, on tech support uh, in uh, New York City. Thanks, uh, Noel. Thank you again. Uh, yeah, you can unmute. Thank you again. Um, no, Mr. Noel, Noel has a response. Uh, can we get? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Chair Holden, thank you very much. I, I do want to commend a, a Do It staff member, um, uh, Joe uh, Caputo, or I'm sorry if I mispronounced his last name. Um, he is, uh, he's uh, fondly known as St. Joe. Um, across a number of uh, uh, community board district offices and, and staff. Um, it, he has a Herculean effort um, as like the primary tech support person for all community boards, all 59 community boards. Um, Joe has done, uh, I, I really wanna speak highly of Joe for, for the work um, that he helps coordinate, um, but he's the only one for 59 agencies. Um, and, and as we're looking at, um, you know, building a, a, a technology budget for the 21st century in light of the pandemic, when community boards are completely remote and agencies are asking them to do more with digital services, as we just heard through DCP, um, there needs to be more resources put aside uh, uh, and, and invested uh, for community boards. The land use conversation was very uh, instrumental in talking about how much training there is for community boards in regards to the ULERT process. I mean, these are the same things that, um, that are needed, not only for the district staff and district managers, but also for the committee members themselves. Um, and so there needs to be a more ro robust uh, support for technology services um, at the community board level. Um, we wrote a whole report about it two years ago um, and this pandemic has continued to highlight the inequities inside of community boards. And we just wanna make sure that that gets echoed in this particular conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, I will next be calling on Mr. Kevin Jones to testify. Mr. Jones, 
Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Starting time. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Holden and uh, City Council members. My name is Kevin Jones. I'm the Associate State Director of Advocacy for AARP New York. We represent 750,000 members of the 50 plus community in New York City. So I just wanna uh, thank you all for giving me the chance to testify today. As some of you may know, New York City's population of older adults is one of the fastest growing demographics in all five boroughs and will continue to make up a greater portion of the city's population in the coming years, which will require greater attention from the city in addressing the needs of this population. Prior to the pandemic, at-home broadband access had already been a growing issue for older New Yorkers as a significant portion of the city's aging population lacked access to high-speed internet in their households. In, in a 2015 report conducted by the Office of the New York City Controller, they found 42% of New Yorkers aged 65 plus lacked access to the internet at home. In addition, they found that 44% of low income New Yorkers lacked, uh, la uh, also lacked internet access in their homes, uh, particularly black and Hispanic households, which disproportionately lack access to broadband when compared to white households in New York City. COVID the COVID-19 pandemic has further highlighted the stark disparities in internet access and created new challenges for the livelihoods of New York City's aging residents. As, uh, as so much of our work, service, and programming has tr transitioned to the internet and online platforms, older adults who lack access to the internet in their homes have faced serious gaps in, in accessing vital services and critical information during the pandemic. Without reliable internet, older adults are struggling to access home delivered meals, routine healthcare, telemedicine, and other services um, such as refilling their medications and grocery deliveries. Older adults are also struggling to sign up for their vaccine appointments without internet access at home and have a more difficult time accessing critical information about the progress of the COVID-19 pandemic and related protocols to protect themselves from contracting the virus. Without sufficient access to the internet, older adults are also missing out on opportunities to participate in online programs and to connect with family and friends remotely throughout the pandemic. These issues have caused significant increase in incidents of social isolation among older adults, which have a real and tangible impact on the physical and mental health of individuals. In addition to many of, of these issues related to broadband access, uh, they've been compounded by the fact that a large portion of the city's older adults do not have sufficient technological literacy or training to remain connected to vital city services or their friends or loved ones. Uh, as, a, as city council and the mayor begin to formulate their FY22 budget, AARP New York calls on the city to make critical investments into broadband infrastructure and related technological services in order to bridge the digital divide and keep the city's 50 plus connected to the internet and the surrounding world. AARP commends the mayor's recent actions to begin delivering on his internet master plan to deliver affordable and universal high-speed internet to New Yorkers across all five boroughs. We believe this plan will aid in closing the digital divide and connecting underserved areas with affordable access to the internet, which is especially critical amid the current pandemic. AARP calls on the mayor and the city council to fully fund this initiative and in all broadband infrastructure uh, in the internet master plan. We also call on the city to expand discretionary funds and other pools of funding for nonprofits uh, such as older adults technology services in order to reach more clients and improve techno technological literacy of older adults across the boroughs. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify today and I'm happy to take questions if anyone has any. Well, then, um, Angelina Martinez, we're really taking over as committee council. I don't see any questions from your colleagues um, unless you have any questions for this witness. Well, I, I just want to uh, echo what uh, Mr. Jones said about obviously uh, during the pandemic, it was uh, the problem was exposed of uh, the obviously the older adults uh, not being. Um, uh, you know, ha not having broadband, not knowing how to use technology, and it costs lives. It's, there's no doubt about that. And um, th this kind of um, what, what Mr. Jones said is we do have to invest in our seniors and certainly in technology. And we are doing that, um, you know, and, and on the council level, but the city has to really get serious about, um, you know, really investing in the education of our older adults uh, with technology. Otherwise, they're left behind, like he mentioned. And um, this time it cost lives. It, it wasn't just an inconvenience, it did cost lives, especially in, in um, and we saw that exposed obviously in the rollout of the vaccine, how our older population could not get appointments at all. And that was the biggest complaint we had in the council office, at least my council office, when the rollout was um, came out in December. 
But I want to thank you, Mr. Jones, for that and certainly uh, bringing that up. And I think it's an important, it's one of the, the most important um, topics that we discussed today. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Holden, our next speaker is Jim Hamlin. Starting time. Hello, good morning. Correction, good afternoon, uh, Chairholder and uh, City Council members. My name is Jim Hamlin McLeod. I'm a representative of Local 1549 and it's 14,000 members under the leadership of local president, Eddie Rodriguez. And um, we cover the CCRs, which is the call center representatives on the Do It. 3-1 Do It plays a critical role in the life of the city by providing information needed to the public. The uses of the system increased, increased during the COVID pandemic remains high. The usage has increased over the past four years overall. The current staffing levels have remained the same the last two years at, as a call, at the call center. However, the number of calls has jumped 15% since 2016, 10% in 2020 and from 2019 alone. T texting increased by 68% from 2019 to 2020, yet staffing remains the same. As you heard Commissioner Tish mention earlier that um, they took over 20 million calls, 24 million calls, which is about 5 million additional calls than the average year. So therefore staffing is a very, is a point issue there as well. Um, there are desks empty right now in the main center in Manhattan due to the spacing for COVID. But however, a satellite position was made in Brooklyn to uh, house more personnel there and their cubicles. Uh, the staff is burnt out due to the volume of calls. They have worked tirelessly throughout this crisis. We are requesting an increase by staffing of 25 or more CCRs. This is appropriate um, uh, proportion of the, what's increased from the increase of the amount of people uh, that's needed. Also, we'd like to talk about the uh, need for interpreters. The city has city civil service interpreters titles that does not, that they, do not, that does they, not, not they don't use. Instead, they use a private low wage uh, phone line for interpretation, interpretation servicing, private contracts interpreter phone line services at times leads to delays and ending calls and confusion and proper information disseminated to the public. It would be better to have interpreters in place of this center at this center that would be uh, city employee trained and city government and servicing information disseminating verbiage and terminology. The number of Spanish speaking calls rose by 25% and 35 and 36 for calls from non English or Spanish speaking people. We would expect these numbers to either stay the same or increase. But the time used for these calls are greater than English um, calls also. We would like the city council to support the increase for CCRs, titles and staffing for 311. I thank you for your time. Any questions that you, you let me know. Uh, yeah, so I, I just have a question. Um, in, uh, in the height of the pandemic, were um, your was the CCRs working uh, double shifts uh, and uh, you know a lot of overtime? Was that um, the norm? Yeah. So um, the CCRs work overtime um, on a volunteer basis, but there was some overtime. Yes, we had a lot of um, members who worked overtime to help out with the call volume, but also, like Commissioner Tiss said, they had to use outside resources such as the cadets, as well as um, another agency that she mentioned to help out with the call volume. So therefore, um, the CCRs are definitely needed, and we actually have to support and to increase those numbers. Um, members also had their own um, issues with their families as having to be in, um, a victim of COVID and also lost loved ones and stuff like that, and still was able to do the job and still come to work and provide the services the city needed. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, I don't see any other council members with questions for Mr. Hamlin. So we can move on to the next witness, and the next witness will be Paula Siegel. Starting time. Uh, my my apologies. One one second. That came up quick. Uh, we just we just changed topics. So good afternoon. Um, I am changing topics. I'm actually here to return to the conversation about the city's commitment to land use and to testify in support of the of 
the Community Land Trust Initiative. I'm here today speaking as the senior attorney in the equitable neighborhood practice of Take Root Justice. Thank you so much for holding this hearing. And I also feel like I just learned a lot about technology. Uh, as you know, Take Root works with grassroots groups, neighborhood organizations, and community coalitions to help make sure that people of color, immigrants, and other low-income residents who built our city are not pushed out in the name of progress. Take Root and 17 partner organizations are part of a citywide community land trust initiative that seeks 1.5 million in city council discretionary funding in 2022 to develop community land trusts and permanently affordable housing, commercial, and community spaces in all five boroughs of the city. In the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, community land trusts have played an, essential, an especially critical role to stabilize housing, combat speculation, and ensure a just recovery in Black, Brown, and immigrant neighborhoods. We ask that this committee, the Land Use Committee, recommend renewed funding for the Citywide Community Land Trust Initiative in the fiscal 22 budget. I emailed supporting materials to committee council this morning um, but I'll just review as much as I can in the time that I have. Um, launched in 2020, the Citywide CLT Initiative has provided crucial support to groups organizing CLTs in the South and Northwest Bronx, East Harlem, Jackson Heights, Brownsville, East New York, and beyond. Community land trusts are community-controlled nonprofits that own land and ensure that it's used to provide permanently affordable housing and other community needs. Take Root specifically serves as a legal services provider to community land trusts and groups incubating community land trusts, advising on corporate form, developing regulatory and governance documents, supporting negotiations with tenants and potential sellers of property, and assisting CLTs in complex closings with multiple parties, including the city's Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Um, we've made major strides in the last two years, and Take Root in particular, I was very proud to be counsel to the East Harlem El Barrio Community Land Trust in its closing on four buildings at the end of last calendar year, as those buildings were acquired from the city, and we continue to represent East Harlem El Barrio necessary transactions as renovations begin. We also represent the Bronx Community Land Trust and are pleased to aid in its formation in the last year. Um, in addition to providing transactional counsel, Take Root supports grassroots groups in the initiative and their policy campaigns, as some members of the committee know, and counsels groups evaluating community land trusts as a strategy on the process and considerations. And we would welcome any referrals from council members who particularly have folks in their districts who are thinking about whether CLTs are right for them. Time expired. Thank you, Ms. Siegel. Um, Chair Holden, there's, I don't see any hands raised for this witness, unless you have questions, I can call on the next witness. You can, you can call on the next witness. Okay, so just so that we're uh, ready, the next witness is I'm gonna call our Deyanira del Rio and followed by John Krinsky. So Ms. Deyanira del Rio, you're next. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Dayanira Del Rio. I'm the co-director of New Economy Project. We are a citywide organization that works with community groups around New York, um, primarily in immigrant and uh, neighborhoods of and low-income neighborhoods of color to promote um, economic justice and to build community-controlled institutions like land trusts um, to support accountable neighborhood-led development. Um, so echoing um, my colleague and previous um, testifier, we are um, wanting to focus today on uh, requesting support for the citywide community land trust initiative for which we're seeking this year 1.5 million um, to expand the initiative uh, to engage 14 uh, community land trusts and groups working to create them. So that's two more land trusts just over the past year that have become established and, and uh, you know, need some capacity building support to carry on their work. Um, we also were planning to expand and bring on a new citywide technical assistance provider to support this growing landscape of CLTs that are now in all five boroughs working in black, brown and immigrant neighborhoods to promote community control over land use neighborhood development. Um, so just wanna say that in less than two years, this really groundbreaking investment by the council in the CLT initiative has made major strides. It's the only example of its kind with which we're familiar around the country. And it's something that 
um, cities are looking at as a model. Um, and just, you know, it's in terms of investment, it's major bang for buck. And we feel like it's a major uh, cost effective investment in permanently affordable housing. It's a way to protect public investment and subsidy that is put into housing and other neighborhood development, because that is what CLTs are chiefly about is retaining permanent affordability and protecting that subsidy um, and then engaging residents in the community uh, and, and other neighborhood and public stakeholders in making sure that uh, development meets community needs and that there's real community decision making and stewardship over the development that happens in their communities. So um, in less than two years, uh, there are now CLTs um, in the South and Northwest Bronx. Um, the Bronx is actually a major hub for CLTs in East Harlem and Lower East Side, Brownsville, Jackson Heights, East New York, and beyond. Um, and, you know, just again, want to thank the council for helping to see this new generation of institutions that are facilitating equitable development and building community wealth. Also want to thank the council for its support of worker co-ops and other models that are advancing shared ownership over our economy as a whole. Um, Again, we wanted to just highlight a couple of uh, activities that are planned. Um, you know, in New York City, the CLTs that we work with are, are addressing a range of land use needs. So not just permanently affordable um, housing, whether it's limited equity housing or mutual housing, multifamily, small one to four family homes, but a whole array of other uses. And I know you've heard some of that and we'll hear others. Time expired. But I um, just want to say groups are looking at protecting um, small business space, retail and other spaces for local small businesses that are at great risk of displacement, providing spaces for worker owned businesses, food cooperatives, financial cooperatives that are meeting the needs of communities redlined by banks, community owned solar energy and a whole array of other uses that really can create thriving neighborhoods, create jobs meet you know all of the needs that our community and our city have and you know thanks so much again for the support of this initiative uh, new economy is a coordinator of the initiative and one of the citywide technical assistance providers um, and we hope that you'll continue to support the investment in clts and also policy making that helps them acquire properties um, for long-term protection and stewardship thank you so much again chair and committee members Thank you, Ms. Del Rio. Um, Chair, I don't see any hands raised from your colleagues. So if you don't have any questions, I can call on our last witness for today. Thank you. Uh, our last witness will be John Krinsky. Starting time. Good afternoon, uh, Committee Chair Salamanca, members of the committee and subcommittee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is John Krinsky. I'm a professor of political science and director of the Community Change Studies Program at City College of New York and a founding member of the New York City Community Land Initiative, or NICELY, um, on whose behalf I'm testifying. So NICELY has been working for the last eight and a half years to expand community land trust as a critical strategy for dealing with the city's deep affordability crisis in housing and the need for greater community control over other land uses. Um, you've heard now about uh, the CLTs that are involved in the uh, council initiative, so I, I will uh, spare you the details again. Um, but it is again uh, uh, worth mentioning that you know, locally CLTs are working to develop not just uh, develop and preserve not just deeply affordable multifamily rental housing, limited equity co-ops, and one to four family homes at risk of foreclosure but also commercial and cultural spaces, community gardens, community-owned solar, microgrids, and other infrastructure, reflecting the flexibility of this community land trust model and its usefulness for actual on-the-ground neighborhood-level land use improvements. In the wake of COVID's devastation, redoubling the efforts toward bringing out the real potential of CLTs across the city is more important than ever. And this is true for a number of reasons. First, there are major private equity backed firms that threaten to take even more land and housing into their portfolios than they did in the wake of the 20, 2008 fiscal uh, financial crisis, both limiting the options for affordability and exacerbating the extreme resource inequality that characterizes not just predominantly white communities on one side and black and brown communities on the other, but also, uncoincidentally, the inequality across these neighborhoods uh, related to COVID-related suffering, death, and economic loss. So empowering efforts to bring at least some of this land and housing into social ownership and long-term community stewardship is critical in preventing the further entrenchment of plutocracy in New York. 
Second, the community groups forming CLTs across the city have a clear sense of community needs based on the long-term relationships built in these communities. In the South Bronx, for example, the Mott Haven Port Mars Community Land Stewards have focused less on housing for the moment and more green space and then converting an abandoned drug treatment facility of Lincoln Hospital into a health education and art center based on community visioning sessions and a community design process they've facilitated over the last several years. In Queens, Chaya CDC is exploring a CLT to preserve affordable re retail space. So while housing remains a significant focus of the CLT movement, the initiative, the council initiative, has been critical in keeping the stewardship of larger land use issues in focus throughout the city. Finally, after two years of the initiative, the energy and understanding that CLT organizers across the city are bringing to their work, the deep understanding of organizing, engagement, training, racial justice, and what it means to foster long-term governance is inspiring and absolutely informs the work of this initiative. If the promise of CLTs is closer to realization, it's largely because the energetic organizers and activists involved in the CLT initiative groups have together studied CLTs nationwide, maintain communication among each other and with national CLT networks, and understand the tasks of development, management, and organizing, and their balance, and are working hard to convey this understanding to the constituents of the growing CLTs around the city. So my small team from City College is among the technical assistance providers helping to structure this process and develop the new gener uh, next generation of workshops, training, and popular education materials in collaboration with these groups. And so we urge the council to redouble its commitment to community land trusts. Thank you for your commitment so far and uh, believe again that it's a critical time to do this and, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Krinsky. Uh, Chair Holden, I don't see any hands raised for questions for this witness. Um, and that was our last witness of this hearing. Well, thank you all for your uh, great testimony. Uh, I'm going to turn it back to my co-chair, Salamanca. Um, thank you very much for a, a great hearing. Well, uh, definitely thank you, uh, Chair Holden, um, and thank you, uh, Council, Lanyu staff, uh, for today's uh, hearing. Uh, and this meeting is hereby adjourned.